I just said we're live. I was. I'm looking at it. Okay. <laughs> hey. Live. I am live. Jesus Christ. I don't know about the rest of you guys. Um. Thank you, everyone, who is coming out to watch us for the Delta Green pre-Halloween panel. A little Q and A and trick or treat uh, with all the creators of the Delta Green RPG. Um, so we thought we would give everybody a chance to um, ask us any questions that they might have. Uh, and I got some pre-questions, uh, aside from the ubiquitous, can I download this later if I don't watch it? Which I get from almost every Delta Green fan. And then I have to explain VOD. Uh, but after that, uh, we have a lot of great stuff from my patrons at Delta Green Dead Channels. First off, though, we should all say thank you to Baz. The micro to my Punisher, without whom I could not do this. Thank you, Baz. Um, Baz. Baz. Thank you, Baz. Baz is silence. He's Thank going quiet. you. Uh, all right. So first question. Uh, oh yeah, I was totally I, muted. Um, yeah, I am. I am the only thing that keeps us running. By the way, there you go. <laughs> so we're clear. And I smoothly. Think, I think established that. I think you've yeah. <laughs> I keep that, it's that close attention to the workings of the technology. Smooth like a gravel road. Now get to get to work, y'all. I'm gonna go hit in the shadows again. <laughs> All right, this one's from me. No one else. No patrons ask this. I get to go first. Favorite Halloween costume you ever wore as a kid. You can't have stared at it enviously. You had to actually go out and get some candy in that thing. Uh, what was your best? What was your best look on the runway? I mean that was so long ago that it's hard to it's hard to pin it down. But I'm gonna I'm I'm going to go with Luke Skywalker. I mean, because I was I was the age when uh, that first one came out. And it, I baseball furies, I was dressed up as the baseball one of the baseball furies in New York and from Warriors. Nineteen, yeah, nineteen ninety. Well, we had a whole group. <laughs> Are of there people. any it others, could, John? <laughs> including, including like I think it was Pernosky and others, but yeah, we went into baseball fury. Nice. <laughs> uh, mine would be uh, Boba Fett um, with a uh, entirely handmade costume, except for the mask, wow. which is just like a like the string, you know, with the plastic front thing from a drugstore. <laughs> Everything else was all like cobbled together with like boots and a cape and pouches and shit. But um, you just gave up on the mask. You're like, you know, like that was way beyond what I could do at like 11 years old. I was just done. <laughs> what I loved about those old, what those old costumes, by the way, is even, even when you dressed as somebody that wasn't wearing a mask, they would still give you a mask so you could look like that. So, you know, if you got the, if are you, you got talking the, about, uh, are you talking about those costumes that was a formless, shapeless bag that had the yeah. name of the thing you were plus a full, <laughs> Picture a full head yeah. to toe picture of the thing you were yeah. plus the mask. Right. Yeah, that was that's the worst. That is a nightmare for me as a child. <laughs> Steve, <laughs> Steve, Steve Austin, it says on your chest. And yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. I, went as, I went as Mr. Spock in one of those, and there was like the Leonard Nimoy like face mask thing, <laughs> and then like the the plastic jumpsuit that said Mr. Spock with like a picture of Mr. <laughs> Spock on the chest. Just, <laughs> Just so like all Mr. the Spock people who we knock on the door, like trick or treat, they're like, "Oh, it's Mr. Spock." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there it is. It says it right there. For me, those costumes were a sign that your parents didn't love. I mean, <laughs> those were the worst. Those Accurate. were absolutely the worst possible costumes that, that you could put on a child. Um, just an absolute torment. Um, and I certainly had to wear them, you know. So, but like the rest of you did at one time or another. How old am I allowed to be in this Halloween costume question? I, it's it's open to yeah. I don't have like a Robert's Rules of Order or anything over here. So yeah, go nuts, whatever um, you feel. We're uh, as a little kid, um, I I uh, having suffered through many uh, shapeless plastic bags, I talked my parents into renting a gorilla cost a gorilla suit one year. <laughs> So I I got to go door to door, uh, you know, uh, letting my inner primate uh, out to ask for candy and such, and nobody had to ask wow. who I was, but they or what I was. 
And since you were already like six foot five, you could really sell that. Yeah, shit too. as a yes, I could sell it as an eleven year old <laughs> at uh, six foot in a gorilla suit. Um, yeah, uh, there was at least one house that said, you know, get out of here. You're too old to be trick or treating. I had to take that mask off to demonstrate that I was in fact still an embryo. Oh, oh, and, oh. and it was valid. Despite the fact that I was, you know, some sort of pituitary freak, I was allowed to have candy. <laughs> but uh, adult costumes are a different matter. I don't All right. care about your adult costumes, Scott. <laughs> well, there's ones you wear out, and then there's just ones you wear at home. Yeah, I didn't say favorite outcast at like Gen Con or After Dark or anything like that. Yeah. Every day is Halloween in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, actual Patreon questions. So, uh, Redwood asked in what sounds like a uh, move towards accountability. Uh, when you started this endeavor, what did you hope to accomplish, if anything? Which endeavor? Uh, oh my God. Delta Green. Green. Yeah, the whole kitten caboodle. Justify yourself. Buddy. Yeah, John, you want to take this one? You're ultimately to blame, buddy. Uh, you know, I uh, wanted to do, like, I grew up for a while with my parents in, as members of a UFO club where they would meet and talk about UFO shit, and I... You're off by, you're off by one letter. You're off by one letter, John. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was a B, it was a T. <laughs> <laughs> it was a club. Um, you could not leave. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think all of us were just like, we were all into that shit and, uh, really wanted to make something very modern for Cthulhu because Cthulhu was very, you know, Call of Cthulhu was very like in the twenties and thirties and we were interested in doing, I don't know, more contemporary stories, I guess. And it seemed like a great, uh, a great part of the genre to get into, to really explore that stuff. Do you feel like you've, you, do you feel like you've come anywhere close to achieving that dream? I, we like knocked out of the park, yeah, like back in 1997. So yeah, no, I think we did a, a great job with it, um, and it's only gone gotten better. Like it, at the time we got that started, like, we had no idea where it was going to go. You know, we were just like, okay, let's yeah. write a scenario and some stuff, and that'll be fun. And then it just yeah. blew up. It was really nice. I mean, John wrote this amazing start off thing that got everybody really interested in it, and then Scott, you know, I remember the day of the binders, like. You know, John's like, oh, by the way, I got like 500 binders from a guy in I don't know, Louisiana or something at the time. And it was it was Clancy's like rough timeline stuff. And I was like, this is fucking amazing. Like, we gotta use this. like, and then it just kind of slowly blew up. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, I think the product, the 97 and 99 books, the only thing that ever failed about them was where they existed in time, just based on the market. Um, you know, I constantly get like, oh, Delta Green, I fucking love that book. And I always think, why did I eat 39 cent cheeseburgers for two years? <laughs> you know, I never see a dollar from it. You know? <laughs> you know, so if it had come out now or something like that, I think it would have been, you know, different. I, I'm glad we did it when we did. My goal was just to try and make something for myself and for my friends that was as cool as I could make it. Um, um. Sorry, quick interruption. I need to. We need to take a brief intermission. There's a Streamlabs issue. Okay. I, sure. I can't. I can't moderate things, and we have a fucking spam bot in the chat. So. Oh. It's, nice. I, it's making me log in a second time. So. One second, right, everyone. Okay. okay. Cool. Uh, all right. Uh, thanks for the patience, everyone. While we banned the banned the robots. Uh, so I'll just go to the next question. So Jaskel asks, uh, are there any plans to save Tynes's El Dia de los Muertos scenario from out of print magazine hell? Uh, love all the work the team does. You keep writing and I'll keep buying. Then why do you hurt us like this? Yeah, <laughs> that, that thing's never going to die, I, John. <laughs> I hope not. Is that the right answer? Yeah, Can we that's not? the right answer. John, John, was that a product of, you know, cough medicine or speed or you know i i like, think what it really was is that like we published like we got we got delta green out the door and then i rewired my brain to work on unknown armies for a while uh, and like oh, all yeah, I, like yeah, everything i yeah. wrote was just unknown armies no matter what i was doing yeah. and so 
it took a while to like shake that out of my system. It's like the flu. <laughs> and and so now it's going to be great. Is everybody's going to be writing in saying Delta Green meets unknown armies? That's amazing. <laughs> when can you publish that? And then Dang, uh, the whole conversation again. Yeah, I had some other. I was going to write an eyes only book for Delta Green around that time, and I started writing it, and it was about a guy who was fucking his car. And I think I talked to Dennis and Dennis was like, this is Unknown Armies, dude. Like, what the hell are you doing? I don't remember that, but that sounds like what something I would say. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've got 60,000 words already. <laughs> what do we do with this? Yeah. Yeah, so no, I don't, we have zero plans to do anything about that. Uh, I, I shudder to think, I think that it might I think ever we'd return. have to have loved ones held hostage, you know, covered in gas yeah. before we would actually publish that again. I think. Yeah, it's a great I indicator think you... we've been kidnapped, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's, your, Our... that's your pod person question. What should we do yeah. about this scenario, John? Was, I think we should publish it. You're just. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like the nice, cool. It's like the nice, refreshing glass of turpentine from that old yeah. call of You know what it could be? We could use that as like the, the $10 million stretch goal the next time there's a Kickstarter. <laughs> if we get the $10 million, we'll publish. The Car Wars crossover no one knew they wanted. There we go. <laughs> I mean, I'll sell out if you throw enough money at me. You know, I, <laughs> Sorry. Principled stance. All right. Yeah. Um, uh, Ukulele Herzegovina asks, are there any elements of the mythos that you guys have not included in DG material that we'd really like to produce scenarios around? I'm going to ask a follow-up question uh, from Horde Rayguns. Are there any characters, groups, plots that you would personally would include in Delta Green stories or products, but don't get to include it because nobody else in Arc Dream likes the idea? Uh, so you could answer one or both of those. So uh, I mean, I think I think Bast kind of fits both of those. Uh, oh wait, we just did a thing. No one likes the idea. Thanks. <laughs> Harsh. Uh, yeah, yeah, Caleb hasn't read wrong. the printed book yet, but actually in the book we just searched and replaced it for Bosk from uh, Star Wars. <laughs> You know, I don't know about the rest of you, but um, so far, nothing I've proposed has gotten shot down like that. Um, clearly, I haven't proposed enough, um, but I have the full confidence that if I pitch a bad or inappropriate idea, one of you guys will absolutely tell me that it's a bad oh, yeah. idea and, and what the objections are. And I'm we're literally poised over the keyboard most of the time <laughs> waiting for yeah. that. Oh, you're you're going to tell me I haven't heard. why it's why it's wrong and what can be salvaged. I just I just know that's going to you know I have full full confidence in the team to, to tell me exactly where it's off the where it's off and how it needs to be you know uh, how how it needs to be readdressed. So I, we've never I've I don't think we've ever had anything. I mean, obviously, Dia de los Muertos. Nobody asked us. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that one, that one, it's not by it's not by the group. That, I'll just say that that one, that one went straight to publication in what was the magazine? Shadis. That was Shadis. Shadis. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. We, no, nobody had an opportunity to nobody had an opportunity to go. Wait a minute. But I, I mean, know, everybody was swimming in that first first printing Delta Green cocaine money. John, you know, John you're going to get the opportunity to go. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> okay. That's, you know, guys, I just wanted—I wanted to, I wanted to like, just jump the shark as early as possible while it was still cool to do so. <laughs> All right, before, it, before it became it, right? a, day one, <laughs> before it became a cliche. Yeah. Um. Uh, but anyways, anybody else got anything that they've ever been? I don't think we've ever had anybody bring something forward and ever have a have a the response from the group be, "Oh, yuck, that's wrong or bad or isn't a seller or won't tickle the." The customers I mean no. Nothing I think we're all mind. pretty. Yeah, we're all pretty aligned in in kind of the background vision. Uh, you know, um, I think as far as stuff I want to bring, uh, I we've mentioned the Dreamlands and a lot of stuff. Scott's got some stuff going on in the Dreamlands, but I really want to bring that forward. And I'm working on a thing. You know, one of the majestic spinoffs. Uh, where you sit in a little cubicle and take some drugs and go to this city and um, 
I, I really want to kind of modernize the Dreamlands in a in a horrible, terrible way where you're well, running around. You've already, so, you already okay. accomplished that with the uh, sleight of hand, man. I mean, oh yeah, but I want I, I mean, want the Delta Green version. I want the Dreamlands to be eating itself because mankind we, is so a, fucked up. And we've had a hundred you know, years for humanity to fracture. Yeah. And, and so, to fracture uh, by communicating with itself more efficiently. Yeah, Dennis, I yeah, think you I'm should share your never running story fan fiction to yourself. <laughs> I, I want I want guys fighting in Zothique who's like, uh, you know, past phrases are like, Norm from Cheers. And the other guy's like, yeah, <laughs> I remember that. Come on in. And, um, yeah. I just want to see the dev guru guy get on Falcor. Be like, Go! <laughs> Is it M4 in one hand? Yeah. <laughs> so far, I've got, uh, you know, as far as elements go, that's a question. I mean, they say, what elements? I mean, I mean, like specific great old ones or a particular theme that we're interested in bringing into it. I've got some great old ones. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I our, our, get... so far, our, so far, our, our, our process is kind of, you know, Oh, that sounds good. Okay, write it. And then yeah. if it gets written, then great, we'll do something with that. And if it doesn't, then especially if you can come forward with here's a element of the mythos that's boring as hell and really didn't yeah. work. How yeah. how can we sex that shit up? And yeah, we got, you know, there's God's teeth with Bast. Hopefully uh dog soldiers uh will yeah. you know do that for Nodens and uh mm -hmm. I got some ideas about uh, Sathagwa and Gatana Toa that I want to I want to bring out that are all sort of um, that are oddly climate change connected. Yeah, I feel um, like Sathagwa was everywhere and also kind of underrepresented in a way, you know, because there's a lot going on beside it just being a big frog guy. Yeah, yeah, that's the least interesting thing about it. And there are <laughs> right. all kinds of other horrible truly at least for me truly disturbing hateful things about it that really make it one of my uh you know I, I've, I've always been intrigued by that thing where the kenyan bitch the worship of sathagwa for the wholesome worship of Cthulhu. right they, they make it very <laughs> clear that things were terrible with the sathagwa and everyone was suddenly horribly shocked when they found out what was it the top of the Ponzi scheme and jump ship to the to the safe, secure, wholesome, traditional worship of the Buddha. <laughs> Back yeah. to their original underground values. There. Um, and I, I, I'll just say that I think a lot of people have, uh, have an idea. The collaboration we have, I'm, I'm very happy with and it's very unique, which is um, you pull a pin on an idea grenade and you chuck it over a fence. It's Here's the manuscript. Have fun, and you get lots of notes and lots of feedback and lots of this is fucked and this is awesome and expand this and shrink this. Caleb just went through this for the last year, um, and you know you got to experience three it. Three years, much like throwing a grenade over a wall. Sometimes <laughs> it gets thrown back with many other right. grenades. Yeah, it's. Uh, Quite, it's quite common, but, but I'll say a lot of RPG books I've worked previously for, you know, other companies, it's an active, live collaboration where it's like, paragraph three, let's fucking change that together here now. And that that's not what we do with Delta Green. And I think it's why the books feel unique. So Iconoclast feels like a Glancy book. Labyrinth feels like a Tynes book. You know, uh, God's Teeth is like Caleb, and hopefully Impossible is like me and Tynes had a horrible, mis disfigured baby. Um, uh, and I think that's one of the huge benefits of working on things like this, is you get a real strong author flavor that you might not get in a standard book with 22 people working on it. Um, so that, that makes the ideas go further and become deeper and better, I think. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Uh, so speaking of that, uh, from this is not a test, uh, what do you like about working with each other? <laughs> is this a trick question? I want to make the, I wanna make the like joke, the, the distance, which is <laughs> yeah. weird because that's not how, that's not how we started. We all started <laughs> stepping on each other's 
dirty clothes and laundry yeah. and yeah. you know and and bad habits and things and you know we in the same house in oddly enough this house because I'm too lazy yeah. to move especially because oh my god you know Mrs. Cohen hasn't raised the rent for like you know five years so really nice yes it's it's quite nice actually um but uh yeah uh when we were living together in ken heights brat house for serial killers um <laughs> it's weird i feel like we got really uh we really got to know each other and each other's writing and work styles and work inspirations and things and then when we split up i feel like we took that intimacy with us yeah you know, I feel like we're still got some of that intimacy hanging around, despite the fact it's been what twenty years since. I mean, how many years has it been since anyone was in this house but me? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's in ninety nine, yeah. I think. Me, yeah. So. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, one thing that I really have noticed and valued over the, over the many many years um, is just like I think we're all super, and this is everyone. This is Shane and Caleb in the works. Just super consistent on like tone. That like Delta Green just consistently feels like Delta Green and, and always has. It's like it's never changed tone. It's never gotten like a little like goofy or lighter or whatever. Like it it really is just still that same like dead eyed obsessive cynical view of reality <laughs> that it always has been. And I'm I'm just so grateful for that and just for like how uncompromising that is. And I think that God's Teeth is a perfect example of that. That that tone has just come through and metastasized and I'm, I'm really proud of that aspect of our work over the years yeah hooray we've infected others yeah yeah um i'll just say uh i owe a ton of the last you know huge resurgence of this to shane who's done just relentless relentless work getting these oh my books, god yes you know edited and you know making them pretty and getting them out there and getting them printed um and you know editing and writing and and doing all this incredible you know editor and still manages to write shit. and and still manages to write let's not forget how much material has poured out yeah of shane. yeah um but i will say that me and shane uh and john and scott and, and even caleb are well suited in that we're like okay we'll have our brief social tete-a-tete -tete for fun where we discuss things high level and then we all just fuck off to our rabbit hole and go in the in the dark type on a computer for five hours and go like hey, this is awesome and you know send it back and forth and that's it, to me that's that's the process and I, whenever i go to somewhere like i worked uh, for monty cook and monty cook is a fantastic guy he wants to do the rabbit process but then they'd have group meetings and you could tell you know monty's like okay i'm gonna go write a game right now you know like he wants and and i remember thinking God, yeah, I want to do that too. I just want to go off and write. Um, so there's a beauty in that. And uh, I think our relationships are built so that works the best. Um, we get together once a year, or once every two years or something like that in person at some con or something. And uh, it's all just goofing around then. I, I miss the house sometimes because it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> Plus that, that lingering aroma of cat piss, I just have such nostalgia for. I mean, it would be even weirder if you guys Sadly, would contrive to move back in there. Yeah. There's a sitcom let, right let, there. Let me assure you that um, if you tried, Jane would meet you at the door with a chainsaw. Um, <laughs> she, she, uh, I wouldn't go against Jane. No. And not the good she guy. Absolutely, uh, absolutely loves her her domain here and would, would, would protect it. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, terminal intensity, shall we say. Understood. Um, but all of our stuff, what I'm really happy about the product is that the product uh, doesn't ever feel like it's written by committee. I never get that scent off of it. Um, mm -hmm. It's still, we've still done a really good job of maintaining the shared tone and the individual voices have still managed to come through and, and, and on their own and be... Uh, be a palatable flavor, you know? Yeah. yeah, which, and there's often collaboration in the text, mm -hmm. but, you know, as, as we've talked about, the fact that we managed to have a pretty consistent mm -hmm. and complementary sense of theme and tone means that the end result 
you know, is never going to feel like this chapter's by so-and-so and and this chapter's by this totally different person or anything like that. You know, if we can, if we can manage to sort of, but you know, my goal is always to try to pay attention and make sure that the, um, that where we've, where we've kind of worked together collaboratively on it, it feels seamless. You know, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to pick apart like, uh oh, this two pages was clearly an Ivy two pages, you know, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> All right. Here's where we can really get the knives out. Um, Vigo asks everyone's favorite published Delta Green op. Uh, I guess you can say your own if you really want to go aggro, but um... <laughs> I don't think so. Um, it's <laughs> I, you know, I, I there. Uh, I actually had to sit down and and sort of like literally go through the and, and actually think about you know what were my favorites and uh, a lot. I, 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 it's really tough. Um, I am still going to lean into Brett Kramer's last thing. I'm going to be boring and lean into last things last because um, it's short and sweet and it gets to the point. And my all-time favorite thing about last things last is the fact that it gives the players this horrible peek into how their character is going to turn out. Mm -hmm. Next case scenario. (laughs) Like, this is the best they can hope for is being a fractured, broken, lonely person who's just lives in a world of, you know, marking time and regrets for jobs left half done or uh, failed, uh, all bonds burnt, no longer useful to the organization. So, up to pasture and those spoilers in a introductory scenario are absolutely worth the price of admission. But whatever the problem that develops in Last Things Last, whatever the 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 the, the uh, MacGuffiner or Fugly turns out to be, that moment of going into his apartment and being like, "Wow, this is <laughs> you know, this is your life." Uh, yeah, the happy ending. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, dead on the bathroom floor and not found for a couple of days is the best you can hope for. Natural cause. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, that that right there is fantastic. But I'm and then the only know, people who that's... really care are the ones covered to cover up your crimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but beyond that, I'm always gonna love night floors. I always love Dennis's night floors. I think he absolutely bullseyed um, surreal horror with that. Uh, that original scenario. Um, and I'm always going to love Stoltz's Star Chamber because it was such a uh, a new way of using role-playing game format to mm-hmm. make the players play all of the unreliable reliable narrators in the scenario. I, I just, I, I, I love that. Rather than having the keeper or the handler or, you know, demonstrate all these people who can't be trusted, the <laughs> players get to, yeah. uh, you know, do it and and do it cool. three different ways so that, you know, the guy who's reliable in version one is completely uh, shithead in version two. And, you know, and none of it, it, none of it agrees. And it's all contradictory because that's what eyewitnesses are all about. Mm-hmm. Um, I really yeah, loved uh, that. That was just a really, it was just a really new thing to do with the role-playing game setting with the, the, the tools that we had. I, those are the three I would pull out that always still I was a monster in that game. God, I was evil. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Next. So, uh, I'll, I'll say Convergence. It's the obvious answer. It's the one that called the tune. It's I immediately, it's like I woke up when I read that. I went, oh my God, there's so much we can do here. It's just, yeah, oh my God. Um, and I, you know, I've run it probably seven or eight times, and it's always just a horrible bloodbath nightmare scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, dear, I dearly <laughs> love it. Oh yeah, and no, I mean, I would say convergence too for all the same reasons. You know, I mean, it, what was what's impressive is is John's summary of what Delta Green was covered maybe half a page at half that point, point, and that half, half a page, 
Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That that right, yeah. half a page had a little so much format. going, had so much promise and so many awesome implications. That yeah, I I read that. I got that and ran the game, and then promptly all I would run is Delta Green, you know, from nineteen ninety three to whenever you know uh, I started actually writing for it, um, yeah. because it was because it just dug its hooks in so well. So good job, uh, John, from when you were. 20 years old I'm, or whatever. I'm the sorry hell I didn't pull. I just saw I didn't pull out Convergence as well, John, but I had a different experience. <laughs> I had just sent you a bunch of material about the men in black to, to be right. published in. And John, you, and you wrote back, yeah, maybe you're going to need to pick up the next issue of the other. So Convergence <laughs> was like being, just being shown you. Oh, you're a day late and a dollar <laughs> short. <laughs> Congratulations. But as a, yeah, as a consolation prize, you want to write about 100,000 words for this thing that we're doing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Devote the rest of your life to it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that. Yeah. For, for, yeah. for my own stuff, I, I would like to nominate Observer Effect, in fact, as, as you mentioned. Um, oh, wait, we're, we're nominating our own stuff? Shit. I can. Okay. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, but yeah, in, in part because that it had such a weird growth cycle. Like originally, originally I had, I had conceived that as a um, as a Savage Worlds scenario to go in one of their compilations to help sort of spread the gospel of what Delta Green was like, and um, that didn't work because it being a Delta Green thing, it took about five times longer to develop than any reasonable publisher could tolerate. So. You know, they fired my ass out of that anthology, and as well they should have. And uh, and then we were primed to kind of put it where it really belonged with the new game. Yep. I, my choice would be uh, Impossible Landscapes. Um, I, I feel like that's like the, uh, like, like all the good parts of House of Leaves and none of the bad parts, um, and then wow. a whole lot more besides. Um, and the thing about that book is that, like, every time I pull it off the shelf and flip through it, I, like, I find stuff in there that I don't remember reading before. And I'm like, what the hell? What is this? And I, I, I actually, like, I wonder sometimes, like, is Dennis, like, swapping different copies into my house when I'm not looking? Because it's, 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 uh, like, it's a universe. It's just a whole universe unto itself. Um, and... There's so much there, and it's so rich and so interconnected um, and so insane that um, I just I, I find it like I think as a physical artifact, like just the book itself is amazing to kind of just like dip into and read through and notice things and put connections together. And God, like I've had to refer to it a bunch actually when um, revising my King and Yellow stories for Whisper Labyrinth. Mm -hmm. um, and every time I go to the index to look up, you know, like, what did, you, what did Dennis do with this thing or other? Like, I find, like, more entries that weren't there last time. <laughs> and it's it's super <laughs> freaky. So I, I think it's an amazing, amazing piece of work. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank Jen, our wonderful layout artist who just fucking killed it on that yeah. book. Yeah, completely. Amazing work. Um, my, I'm going to pick Future Perfect. It's like the fourth oh. or fifth RPG scenario I ever read because I was pretty late to the game and Ross was reading it. And when I got to the end, I'm like, wait, so if you touch the MacGuffin, you just you just die? There's no, like, roll? You can just, you can just do that? Like, that's allowed? Uh, yeah, that that was... I remember that thank still. You, thank you. Yeah. Fuck your agents. That, mm -hmm. That's my general policy. <laughs> they touch something? Yeah, they're probably dead. That feels like a large part of writing Delta Green is really getting into the zone and going, <laughs> that's going to fuck them up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, next question. Um, when will someone associated with Arc Dream run an actual play of Iconoclast? That is boom for real. Okay, yeah, well, as soon Scott. as my, as soon as you meet my price, I mean, <laughs> there it is. Uh, sorry, uh, if somebody you know wants you don't to come to these panels to, for bullshit, people, you come for proof. <laughs> I got I got bills to pay, and, and I'll tell you, <laughs> you know, he's 
These miniatures, these miniatures are not gonna buy themselves. Is all I gotta They're say. Not gonna, right? I thought so, you were gonna say not gonna paint themselves. And I was gonna oh, say, yeah. I don't do that either. But let's let's yeah. get straight <laughs> what the important part of it is. It's the acquisition. <laughs> yeah, it's the yeah. buying. Uh, so they can all sit in a box, uh, you know, and stare out at me. Um, yeah, but, the the yeah, price I, is to paint Scott's miniatures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rude. there you go. Um, I was actually, no, I, um, yeah, I was with a very nice podcast uh, that asked me to run God's Teeth but much the same way. And they're like, look, it's great. We'll pay you for your time and stuff like that. And I started thinking about like the price I would need to ask for to read that goddamn book again. And I was just like, I can't do it for you guys. I'll run another game. I will happily run Delta Green for you. But no, it, you can't. You're a humble actual play podcast. That number is not realistic. <laughs> So I get I get where you're coming from uh, there. But, yeah, you know I I really would like to. Uh, um, I playing. Uh, I really enjoyed the times that I've run it before, um, especially when I was just running the cold open uh, at cons. Was sort of the introduction to it. Um, I love that fortune scenario. It's one of my favorite openings for Delta. Just play play the cocksuckers and get horribly murdered on <laughs> videotape. It's just awesome. Well, what a great idea. I mean, I, it's something I hope we get to do more of. The, the cold open or something. Because yeah. we're, we're living in an age when we've got a yeah. global TV studio in our pocket. So, of course, this stuff's going to be on video. And what's going to be more boring than the handler describing the video to the yeah. players mm -hmm. during a brief yeah. I, I, I feel yeah. like it will only be impactful if the players play the clue. Yeah. Fun. And then that, they'll really enjoy that. They'll enjoy having the setup that way. The, 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 goal, for, the goal for the next one of those is, is uh, to me, has got to be including like private instructions for each player of this is what the AI algorithm shapes your <laughs> character to say during this video because somebody's <laughs> already fucked with the video and changed it. <laughs> so you have to say crazy, you know, seven fingers on a hand kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember doing a, a like a copy pass on Iconoclast and being pissed because I couldn't play it now, like, because I'd read it. I was, I was furious by the time I got to the end of it. It's like, well, fuck. I can't run that. And I can't be in that anymore. Like, yeah. Uh, I wish I could pay the return compliment, but when I was looking through God's Teeth and editing, <laughs> yeah. all I could think is thinking, thank God I only have to edit this. Thank God I only have to edit this. Thank God I only have to edit this. Because it was one of the most uncomfortable experiences yes. I've ever had. Uh, yes. Just reading I, through I had it. A, like, I had a blast running it. We just wrapped up a, a, a long campaign of God's Teeth in my uh, one, in my weekly game. And um, and uh, and it, it was great. You know, I mean, it, you know, it helps to have players who are all kind of on the same page when it comes to uh, just how shitty the world is and how much bleak humor we can wring out of that. Yeah, you gotta you gotta hold hands and walk over the cliff together. You don't want anyone <laughs> with second thoughts before you start that one. Um, Why are you gunning it, Thelma? <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So, uh, speaking of the cold open of Iconoclast, Stephen Lee asks, "I love the Delta Green system and find the accessibility of the mechanics a real feature. I'm always tempted to use it for investigations that involve civilians, non-Delta Green people." I think I love actual plays and scenarios best where there are regular people rather than agents running the paranormal or supernatural. Do you have any thoughts or plans about supporting non-GG scenarios in the DG universe? I think the cold open thing is a pretty great idea to start that as, you know, play the poor bastards that DG finds <laughs> the remains I'm, of. Yeah. I have a scenario. Uh, sorry, I have a scenario for Phenomenex. That's about halfway done, where you're these horrible cable guys running around the Jersey, the Barrens, the uh, Pine Barrens in New Jersey, looking for the the Baron Beast, um, and uh, getting lost and getting drunk and wandering around in the dark with you know IR cameras trying to find this thing. Um, so yeah, I mean that with mythos elements clearly, um, but yeah, that's the only one I have going like that. Everything else is DG. 
Yeah, I've, I've got at least for for the Sathagwa material I'm working on, um, I was very grateful to all of the um, all of the information that came out after the Deepwater Horizon disaster because I got all kinds of incredibly detailed uh, material on on drilling rigs, on mobile drilling rigs, wow. and as the ice pack rolls back from Hyperbore, I mean Greenland, um, <laughs> I have. No doubt that uh, various companies will be slant drilling under the continent and poking a hole in the kai. And I oh, cool. want to I want to open that up with, you know, the the first horror movie, which are the guys who poke a hole in the kai, and what becomes of them and what they can what any survivors can tell the Delta Green agents as they're being debriefed at Thule uh, Air Force Base <laughs> up on the. Uh, North, uh, north, uh, west coast of Greenland. After that, all you know uh, happens. There'll be at least there'll be at least that happening. So, oh yeah, and I mean, I'm, there's there's got to be there's got to be a million things you could do with the way people the way we're in Antarctica these days. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing I would love to do is uh, I'm thinking of is. Uh, one of the one of the one of the books that I owe people from way back <clears throat> is a campaign about the fate the the cult in New York the sorcerer cult in New York City and um, I think it would be I think it's going to be a blast to have um, part of that campaign be playing members of the fate you know these sort of would be powerhouse sorcerers that are just doing everything they can to chase zero sanity. That's fun. I have a couple I haven't figured out yet. I had a, I have a, like a smoke jumper Cthulhu, Cthulhu one that I haven't figured out what yet, but I can watch like documentaries about smoke jumpers, but I, I feel like I need to talk to a guy who's crazy enough to do that shit first. And <laughs> I haven't, I haven't done that yet. So, um, yeah, the civilian ones are pretty interesting for me too. Uh, what's next? I mean, uh, if we could a scenario where the the players are the civilians and uh, possibly even the problem that Delta Green is trying to solve, where suddenly, I mean, yeah. make a great campaign, uh, a great uh, convention game, where Delta Green's only presence is in the form of those uh, sedans full of people in suits that are jumping out, yeah. you know, to not deliver any help. But uh, to solve yeah. solve the problem, the, the, the Michael the Michael Clayton fixers in the car following you around, with the, you yeah. know, the heart attack yes. drug and the bomb, and <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Um. Okay. So Skeletorzo, Skeletorzo, Skeletorzo. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, what gold do you think can be mined from the recent rise in both leaderless cults or movements? Uh, like financial investment cults, a la crypto tech companies with the presence of online and MLMs. So I, I would, I would like to, I would like to, I would like to point this one at John because he's the one that's got the the hard departure coming up. So we need mm -hmm. to mine <laughs> him for all the gold we can get. Oh God, it's fool's gold, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, the main <laughs> thing that, that occurs to me about that stuff is that, like, if you look at um. Uh, you know, God, the, uh, the mega conspiracy theory stuff, um, like it's all sort of like it's crowdsourced sort of. And a lot of different people have propped themselves up as like nominal leaders of those things. And what it means is that like the moment there's anything resembling orthodoxy, there's immediately schism and like all these different, you know, personality people on you know social media or whatever break off with their like no it's jfk jr's back from the dead no it's pizza game like all that stuff right so <laughs> and the fact that it means that they're like it's like ultimate capitalism where all these different factions of the same cult are competing with each other for likes and followers and subscribers and patreon donations and so forth and like that's kind of interesting to me because that just suggests that um like you would instead of it being this like monolithic order of dagon you would actually have like this competitive, like backstabbing, 
you know, sects of sects who are um, combating each other over, you know, who is the true believer of this thing or whatever. And I think that's kind of a fun thing that maybe you could light a match to and blow up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's it's part of the, it's our world now. I mean, yeah. all of the, you know, we, we, we have all this, I guess, you know, the, 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 these sort of things dominate our politics and our economy now. We had the fucking Bored Apes Yacht Club. That was a thing we're going to have to explain to people where a couple of billion dollars in value went, you know, right out of the economy. Um, I mean, it went you know, somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's all, I mean, this is all um, kind of monetized FOMO. You know this 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 fear that somehow line go up me not on line go up, you know I will say I, and and this I mean I get that this kind of hysteria could be easily mined or attached to the kind of to you know some hyper geometrical project or some something like that we just gotta I just don't want it this is a horror particular to humans. I, I kind of feel like that the mythos as it is would be above it, you know. Well, and, it, and it's, yeah. it's interesting to me because one of the you know one of the so one of the things that we usually do with Delta Green is the horrible horrible stuff that's happening often has some kind of agency such that your agents can pursue it and can try to kill it in some way, whereas this stuff that you're talking about it's it's like spontaneous almost you know what i mean like there's there's always some asshole who starts the horribleness but the way it you know the way it takes off I yeah mean, that father you, son team that? out of the philippines they don't they they stopped being able to <laughs> yeah it's like that was just a lark the first, five years at, ago yeah. after they hijacked it from that south african guy that was the end of their control over it you know right, yeah. they they and then it's off to the races uh, I, think, I think I think I think one of the really important things we we've uh, done for Delta Green in the past is uh, avoided things that either would become ephemeral over time or like this whole MAGA JFK Jr. All this it it's tissue paper that's kind of surrounded the world and everybody, including the people who follow it, don't really believe it. Some of them do. But for the most part, it's just garbage that's being, it's the equivalent of going to search for an image of a duck online and you get 2 million Pinterest hits with pictures of ducks. You know, it's, and you click through and you're on, sign up for Pinterest. Fuck you, Pinterest. I just want a picture of a duck. This is, this is the, the, the information equivalent of that. Um, the the, the you know. heart of the conspiracy is drink your Ovaltine. <laughs> yeah, it's all garbage. I mean, everybody knows this, but, uh, like, one of the really smart things I think Scott and John did early on was, like, JFK? Yeah, JFK's, you know, he's his own fucking thing. You know, the, the Greys didn't hit up the Migo and drive down in a car and set up in the book depository with a space-age rifle and shoot him in the face. You know, um, so I'm really leery around things like this, where, you know, it'd be cool to have say, to take the idea and go, okay, well, a little bit of hypergeometry uh, escaped the lab and is now turning up on children's videos and YouTube and, you know, find out how, stop it, and muddy the signal or something like that. Um, I, I could see that. Or, I mean, we have one of those things. We have that, you know, number, the Curtis equation that turns up all over the place. Um, but yeah, it's... You know, the, I, 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 God, I just fucking hate Trump and all that garbage. I just, you know, so it, it, it I, I, mean, hours. Just, I used it thoroughly in God's teeth, but I figured if something actually evil was happening and somebody was throwing that much chaff, it yeah. would not look a gift horse in the mouth that it would hide yeah. under that chaff. Uh, yeah. And then the, uh, the other thing I think that you can really take from it is that. Just because everyone's in the cult, it doesn't mean they're all in the cult for the same reason or that they know right. what the cult is actually there for. That's the thing I try mm -hmm. 
and work into stuff. But like, as far as like QAnon cults, yeah. like with actual hypergeometry or like crypto boys, because like the second it really does something, the second that fucking spell works, it has more value than everything of crypto that's ever been yeah. coined. Like, reality is allergic to those things. It just vaporizes right, right. them around it. Like, the second the shit actually has a function, no one's right. going to spread it around. No one's going right. to share it to anybody. Right, right. They're going to hide yeah. it. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's, it's, yeah. Tu it's tough to write something, to, for me anyway, it's tough to write something compelling about, about the conspiracy theories that are all over the place now because they all are so dependent on people being dumb and gullible yeah. and like yeah. well you can gullible. you can tell that they were written by committee because they're so bad they're yeah. so poorly yeah. written yeah. I, they but I, up. I on the other hand <laughs> we were in the wrong business they probably will yeah we we <laughs> you could have made a lot more money dennis if you had just i know into, <laughs> yeah. you okay, should have gone for the full hubbard yeah, but I can see, I can see it. You know, this out. team could make such a fucking cult if we wanted to. I know. Amazing. It's like, listen, listen up, Bannon, JFK Jr. <laughs> fuck that shit. This is gonna blow your minds. Give me my million the, dollar check. I got the flow chart and everything. <laughs> but I can see the players using that nonsense to cover their tracks <laughs> if they want to dip into oh, yeah. QAnon, or if the the players run up uh, up against a witness. Who is going to filter everything he saw through his QAnon bullshit? Yeah, they're going to um, use that. That's yeah. that's another thing. That that's fantastic. That's going to just be that's going to be part of the environment. We can't escape that. Yeah, um, it's, oh yeah, it was, it was yeah. One of the most dispiriting things that I wrote in the Handler's Guide was coming into the modern day history of Delta Green oh. and realizing that you know Charlie Bostic and the whole Delta Green disinformation machine would have to be hip deep in fostering this kind of thing, you know, yeah. in making making people believe less and less in the possibility of anything yeah. being true because their mission is to obscure. Yeah, well, I, I got into, you know, some guy on the web was, you know, on the Patreon was like, well, why isn't this stuff on YouTube then? And I'm like, it fucking is. Like, wait, mm -hmm. the fuck, the congressional hearings are going on about alien bodies. On the weekend, and you're like, like I should get a fucking royalty check every time I listen <laughs> to one of these things. Like, oh, it's a spaceship that's bigger on the inside than the outside, filled with packed dirt and little. And you, I'm like, I fucking wrote that in 1996, motherfucker. Hook me up. Where's my money? Like, um, so, but I guess the bigger point is, yeah, it's the stuff, like the idea of this stuff being exposed or revealed or. It would just be thrown on the pile of garbage. People would just go, okay, you know. And Delta Green would, you know, if they're smart, the program would be churning out thousands of uh, AI fakes showing, oh, it's the making of the monster that crawled from the swamp. It's a bunch of guys standing in a field with a suit, and mm -hmm. you know. Um, it's, it's just, but I, I guess the bigger, the bigger thing is we try and be oblique. We don't, we don't just leap into the fray of the most popular conversation piece or the strangest thing going on hopefully that's the goal sometimes we do but i really don't want to um so if we did use this it would be something like scott said which is okay everybody fucked up how do we cover this up have you guys seen those videos on jfk jr with the people walking around in texas we got to do something like that um and you know i could totally see delta green going full in on like and a guy, you know, an agent accidentally running a fucking remote cult and, uh, you know, getting turned up on, you know, uh, CNN. Like, you are the owner of the IP address where this was, oh, fuck me. He's an FBI agent and, oh, my God. That sounds right. awesome, actually. You <laughs> direct that, Scott. Yeah, or, like, where the guy running the disinformation campaign is, you know, becoming rich because of it and just yeah. goes like, yes, it hurts, you know, where he's like, yes, I am the puppet master of the conspiracy and you got to go take his ass out. Mm -hmm. Oh my Anybody God. Act I, I, actually, I, he actually knows shit. So you can't really poke him too hard. You're like, you literally have to just punch his clock and make sure no one figures it out. Don't poke him. Don't warn him. Just take him out. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's no talking him down off the ledge at that point, and you just push. <laughs> That's him. awesome. 
That's a good idea. Yeah. Right, that's good. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> this agent has figured out how to get endless money and sex out of Delta Green. We've got to do something about this. <laughs> Just you like know, Dennis. People people have different <laughs> people have different ways of coping. Um, I, I hope to write something uh, where the, the, you know, it's the standard small town. Everyone goes to a small town with their Delta Green agents to investigate the weird thing. And I, I remember reading a story about some constitutional sheriff who went and deputized half the town uh, to, to strut around with their firearms on and intimidate voters and you know, it was this very weird story, and I I love the, the 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 agents show up to deal with a problem and are immediately set upon by these guys who are convinced that they're part of the they're the deep state. Um, <laughs> but they would have thought they were part of the deep state if they had been up here to go camping. Yeah, you know, yeah. Every, it's everybody just that is. the the broken clock is right. And um, <laughs> they show up and just immediately begin screwing up the operation. Say, who told you? They, <laughs> because they think this is all about them and not about, you know, Cooter McGee, you know? Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. the extra horrible thing would have be, you know, have a constitutional sheriff running the town uh, in Owlshead Mountain to just, you know, make things horrible for the agents, you know, because they've, they're... They have they, they have their line of bullshit that they absolutely believe. At least they're going to performatively, you know. All right, believe. we've we've held Tynes hostage. We've got to get him back. He's only do allowed you, an hour. Do you have out to run? I, although, like as you're talking, Scott, I was thinking, like, actually, it would be kind of cool to run an op that's set during January sixth, where oh, you're you're tailing some asshole who's going to the Capitol and like for the rally, and then you're like, oh fuck, this is it, the balloon's going up, and <laughs> and you actually like you're in the you're in the Capitol building, you know, like in the hallways, like ducking the guards and trying to take out this one motherfucker, you know, the QAnon shaman or whoever that is going <laughs> to cause a problem. That would be a, he was a different he was a different shot. He wanted to draw something on a wall that involved yeah, a lot exactly. of math. <laughs> yeah, because he's gonna, he's going to like inscribe a gate inside Pelosi's office, you know, closet or something, and you've got like take that guy out and like oh fuck, we're on live stream. Like yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, but that's this is this is the danger of going too too close to reality because that's giving that QAnon shaman idiot way too much credit. <laughs> He's obviously yes. the decoy shaman. You always <laughs> threat the shaman. shaman. Yeah, it's you know, it's like Saddam, like the right, one right. wearing all the gold. That's not the real one. Like, yeah. Yes, that's accurate. Well, it's been awesome, guys. I will see y'all later. Uh, have fun. See you, John. I'll talk to you out. See you. Yeah. Seeing you. Take care. Uh, we had another are we, question. Aren't we supposed but... to? Aren't we supposed to say be seeing you when he leaves? I think we screwed that up. Uh, I think he, he did. He said it. Yeah. All right. It was out there at least uh, once. Yeah. So we had this question, uh, kinda and tangentially, but Agent Barca has asked if the Handler's Guide was written today, what would be some fun explanation for David Grush and the other UAP testimonies uh, recently uh, dropped? I, I, How does that I work change, into the timeline? I wouldn't change anything. Yeah. I mean, we literally wrote it's a special access program with. <laughs> controlled by a government contractor who has no government oversight, really. Um, people are read into it, and they've been investigating tech since the 1940s and reverse engineering it. That is literally the Delta Green Handler's Guide, 100%. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. fair enough. And, you know, I, I um, you just leave it where it stands. Because um, remember, all of, his, all of his stuff is, I was told by a guy. Yeah, all yeah. he did, really presented was a bunch of. I heard from a guy who heard from a guy who was standing around the water cooler. At, what was he? Air Force <laughs> intelligence was that his thing? He was, uh, but you know, you know, and, and I'm like, okay, cool. This is groundbreaking. Did he hurt? Yeah. He heard from a guy who heard from a guy, but I'm not going to give you any names. He, I mean, he was, he was. I found that whole thing. I watched it because I think I was. Somebody told me I was supposed to, and I'm. I was bored to tears by it. it yeah, he, he just... can't. He can't. He literally can't say anything. And you know, the skiff stuff is interesting because they brought in a bunch of colonels. They brought like they're they're bringing in Air Force people who have been named by him 
to question them. And when they come out, they have nothing to say. The, the yeah. Congress people, they, they literally well, say, oh, well, you know, we can't talk about it. And there's there's always been unidentified aerial phenomena. You know, there's yeah. always been UFOs. It's just yeah. that it's always been Cold War shit. It's always been yeah. I just the race yeah, for I, technology. I, I think Delta Green is just spot on, pitch perfect. It, it seems like it was written now, the Handler's Guide, for the U, especially for the UFO SAP mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Right. There's there's no reason to change any of that. He doesn't add. He didn't yeah. add anything to, you know, uh, our fictional mythos. If anything, yeah, you, know, at, 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 you could you can use it as as kind of a uh, an inspirational example of what happens when somebody tries to rat out the program. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, this is what for you all these well, revelations. What's actually happened? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I also, uh, you know, he started talking about the whole Mussolini UFO, the whole, uh, you know. German Nazi bell stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, I got like 16 books on that that I've read, you know, since 1975. Like, mm-hmm. it's pretty clear he picked up a book somewhere and looked at he, it. He could have just cribbed about. Ken Height's book on the bell. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, you know, nothing much changes. Uh, Call me when they're touring the gray corpse around America. Yeah. Like Jesse James's yeah. body, and I can yeah. go <laughs> touch it with my hands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I actually I'm writing a a story where the the reason the government is covering all this shit up is uh human consciousness forms the godhead and the godhead changes every so when you think of when enough people think about this shit, discs fall from the sky filled with terrifying technology because they invented it, they made it, and the government doesn't want anybody to really think about it seriously, so they made it a joke. <laughs> um, so it doesn't manifest anymore, and now it's starting to re-manifest and how to stop it. I'm writing a book on that, but it's it's quite fun. <laughs> nice. Uh, all right. Uh, next question. Uh, Boom for real asks. Delta Green seems to have a strong fixation on the past. I'm thinking here of the decision to revise and relaunch the conspiracy, but also that most DG operations seem to focus on dealing with cleaning up mistakes from the past. March Technologies, Cowboys vs. Program, stuff in old green boxes. Uh, 15 year jumps in God's teeth and in possible landscapes. Is this intentional? And if so, what's the reasoning behind the decision? Oh, I can't answer that easy um, in two parts. Number one, we're old. And number two, we're slow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, the, you know, it, we wind up, we wind up spending years sort of addressing the fact that, uh, you know, that we had years of material to catch up on. Mm-hmm. 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 And and besides, it's a pillar of Lovecraftian, I don't know if it's cosmic, but it's a pillar of Lovecraftian horror of the past consuming, you know, the, the past coming forward to consume the present. Yeah. Uh, um, that, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty standard. So, um, and, and for most conspiracy thrillers, uh, the tropes are secrets not staying buried. Uh, mm-hmm. The sins of the past, you know, the, that bill coming due now. Those are just common themes of of conspiracy thrillers. Uh, based, yeah. All, all, also, the protagonists fucking something up and having it come back and bite them in the ass is kind of a classic mm-hmm. Lovecraft mm-hmm. theme. Like, oh, we went then. Oh my God, the base camp's gone, and they're all that. You know, like it all begins with good intentions and scientific inquiry, and we're going to fix this, and it all ends in screaming and. And the next thing you know, they're saying, "Please, please don't, please don't launch the Starkweather Moor expedition, right? You know, <laughs> yes, don't, yes. don't do that." Um, yes. so, uh, uh, so, so, yeah, and intelligence, you know, intelligence is about the past. Uh, military intelligence is is about ex- sifting through the past and trying to figure out what possible futures might come of it. So, kind of makes a lot of sense that Delta Green would be facing in that direction. Mm-hmm. And bad intelligence is misunderstanding and ignoring those lessons. Which yes. We get yeah. far more often, both in games yes. and in real life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, we're, we're not getting any money from the CIA to make them look good by writing our stuff about how awesome spies are. So, <laughs> so you get to get the stuff about how fucked up it all is. And besides, um, I mean, it's... 
one of the other tropes of this kind of gaming is uh, is the investigation is about something that's happened in the past. The question is how long ago and how long ago are the roots? I mean, sure, the murder may have happened last week, but the means and motive may have been created centuries ago in a cod or, you know, mm-hmm. in Tenochtitlan in or someplace like that. Uh, so... And again, it, it's all definitely it's definitely a trope of Lovecraftian uh, horror, the age of the earth. I mean, uh, Charles Strauss did this really interesting presentation uh, about how the world changed during Lovecraft's lifetime, starting in 1890, the discovery of galaxies, the right. fact that we weren't looking at individual stars, suddenly the universe gets a billion times larger. I mean, just zero after zero is added to the size of the universe, and zero after zero is added to the age of the universe and to the age of the Earth during his lifetime. And he, you know, sort of Strauss laid out the math for this, and then he was a really unpleasant fellow when it went back and showed how uh, computing power has increased at a faster rate than the measurement of our universe did Mm -hmm. during his time period that we're living through a similar gigantic leap of uh of orders of magnitude of (laughs) what's what's the word for you know a exponential order yeah thank you (laughs) yeah those uh those new quantum the new quantum computers (laughs) yeah the new quantum computers can burn 256 crypto like (laughs) <laughs> yeah. No, the, um, so so when I when I worked in Vancouver at Hothead Games, the company upstairs was D Wave and they're the big quantum they have the the biggest qubit quantum computer in the world. Google bought it. Um and the guy up there was basically just talking. We they had a little cafeteria and everybody'd sit and eat. Those guys would talk sometimes and they, he's like, Yeah, we're killing passwords, man. Like, passwords aren't going to exist anymore. I'm like, well, what are people going to do? He's like, it's going to be biometric, but even that's not going to work for long. Um, and I was just like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you put it you put in a question, and if there is a, a, a collapse state for that question, if there's one outcome possible, the answer is nearly instantaneous. It's immeasurable how fast it is, basically. It just goes, yep, here's the lock. Here's your 256 hash. Done. This is the only way it could possibly go. And I was just, I was horrified by that in 2008. Uh-huh. You know, but now in 2023. I'm sure everything's no fine since, I'm, I'm sure everything's fine since then. <laughs> yeah, what, I what, no idea. what could happen in a mere 15 years, Dennis? They had to, they had to like balance like chlorine atoms in a field and all this in, you know, 2008 or 2009. And now they have stable quantum computers that can run relatively room temperature, you know, they're very hyper cold, but not, you know, yeah. so that, that shit's going to destroy everything. Caleb's exactly right. Some guy's going to just unlock every, every bank account on the planet in, you know, 15 or 20 minutes one day and start draining funds. For God's sakes, Dennis, don't create a scenario where those guys trying to sell gold were in the right. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to live in that world. I mean, but again, yeah. but again, you talk about real magic. I don't know if I'm the guy who figures that out first. I maybe steal yeah. one or two bank accounts, and I don't let anybody know I know how to do this shit. Yeah, um, that's really true. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, next question, both related. Uh, Agent two forty two asked, "Will there be a Kickstarter for DG Second Edition?" And Agent Brown asks, any new Kickstarters in the work that I can back for all books offered? <laughs> um, not not imminently, because because um, we uh, still working. We already yeah. owe you some books, <laughs> so mm-hmm. so we're gonna mm-hmm. get out from. We gotta we gotta get a couple of books out. Um, but, Is there uh, but, a yeah. need for a second edition? I mean, do we? What? Oh, I can't wait! I can't wait to do to, to do second edition. I've got loads of improvements to make. I've tested um, some stuff already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It'll it'll so, happen. It won't be for years yet. I yeah, think. it'll be a while because yeah, yeah. Um, but but yeah, I mean, it's not like we have a shortage of things to you know of ideas, but 
Mm-hmm. Um, but the more, but the more awesome suggestions like that that you give us, the more you distract us from finishing the stuff we're supposed to work on. <laughs> Don't make excuses, Shane. My God! So way to go, if, if you agent two. Yeah, if, if they if, if they want the Pisces material, they don't want me running iconoclasts for a group. Of yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's just some there's just some something about you, agent two four two. Sorry, this, no it's else. a shame you're not doing a Gen Con table anymore. I'd love to hear that pitch. Stop talking to me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Get out of here. Get your shit <laughs> out of here. You keep walking. Yeah, like. <laughs> I, I posted. I posted that you know the the scene where Fred pulls off the mask on the monster in Scooby Doo, and it was it was basically new idea, and you pull it off. It's just pro- <laughs> procrastination underneath. It. That's yeah. that's exactly that's mm-hmm. that's us. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, what do we got? So, if next? you want to talk about the second edition of Godlike, we're all over that shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um. Okay. Spe- speaking of. Agent Alexander asks, uh, fatalism and inevitability are recurring themes in Impossible Landscapes and God's Teeth. How can a handler balance this with a game's need to offer meaningful choices to the player? I wrote a section about it, so I have ideas, but I'd like to hear yours, Daisy. I'll just straight up say that balance has no place in Delta Green. The entire concept is alien. Um, That's not what the game is about. If you want to play Delta Green balance, that's fine. But that's not what we're writing. We're writing a, a, not only can mankind not gain control, mankind can't even comprehend the universe. And we don't do things like, take one agent, he's worth two and a half deep ones. Like, that just never, like, one deep one could cut through six agents, like, hot butter without any difficulty, most likely. All you need is the right environment. You don't have to be, you don't have to sugar it up or right. change its stats. You know, it's right, right. And uh, the choices, making important choices is the centerpiece of Delta Green. And these are more than any other game I know, we do, we, we put moral choices front and center and make you make awful moral choices in the hopes of performing a greater good, which almost never works out. Um, but those choices are everywhere in Delta Green. If, if you don't see those in Impossible Landscapes or God's Teeth, uh, you know, I don't know how we could have written it in another way to project those choices better. Because I, I feel like, if, I, I don't know, I'm not speaking for you, Caleb, but I feel like Impossible Landscapes is filled with hundreds of meaningful moral choices that are utterly bizarre and alien and strange. But when you make them, there are definite repercussions and things happen because you did them. Um, I guess looking for the kind of like shoot the beastie for 32 hit points and you win is not, is kind of not what we do. So, uh, I mean, you could do it with the game. You could make a Delta Green game that does that. And if that's what you have fun with doing, that's awesome. You know, go do that. but we're definitely not writing. I'm not writing for that. Uh, I don't mm-hmm. know about Caleb. No, I just view it matters of scale. Like, I think both of those campaigns have tons of meaningful choices, but they're meaningful to the characters. Mm-hmm. They might be meaningful to the Delta Green organization. But I am of the opinion that meaning is a matter of scale. Like, if you're stranded in the middle of the ocean, you don't have a lot of control. And you might think if you're stranded in the middle of the ocean with a boat and a motor, you have a ton of control. But, like, just scroll out. Like, a tidal wave comes, doesn't matter you're in a fucking boat. Asteroid comes, doesn't matter you're in a boat. The planet goes into the sun, doesn't matter that you're in a boat. Like, the the control, like, the second you zoom out, it didn't have meaning anymore because it's too small and too many subsets. And that's Delta Green. Like, it's, Mm -hmm. it's meaningful to you, but that's because you have a very narrow human focus and the thing you do for the horror is just you let the handler zoom out real fast. Yeah. You can decide not to be terrible to your kids, but you are never ever going to punch Cthulhu in the face. That's just not yeah, the thing. Right, that's gonna right, happen. right. And we're almost always terrible to our kids in Delta Green. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I burn I burn bonds all the time, man. Like, yeah, fuck Timmy. <laughs> I, I'm at a nine. I need those sand points. The mission calls for it. 
I need to. I I don't have the time to scrub that much audio, but I need to do it <laughs> with three hours of dead channels. I do need to do a supercut of every time an agent said, "Well, fuck X family member." <laughs> That's right, because they were projecting. It would probably go on right. for like a significant amount of time. Yeah, that that just makes me so happy. It really yeah. does. Um, you know, when it comes to these choices, I I want to make sure that I mean, if I had any advice whatsoever. It, to, to, to handlers or, or is to always make sure to do the old improv yes and you know mm -hmm. rather than tell the players no you can't make that decision or you know uh, and I don't mean and, and but and I you know it's not something you necessarily you don't want to have a uh, every game be as dealing with fatalism and uh you know, uh, fate as hard as those two campaigns. You don't want every game to be that like that because I I think it's just gonna it's gonna annoy players uh, eventually that they feel like that they are you know that they don't have. Like, uh, holy shit! Uh, you don't want to play them back to back for those campaigns. That's yeah. Right. But you know, um, <laughs> when you're when you're in the middle of it, always give them plenty of choices, and uh, you know the the whole point is that. That they they're gonna have micro effects, but they're they're not gonna get you out of the. You're, you're, there's not one choice that's going to get you out of the problem. Mm -hmm. That's gonna solve this thing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so uh, I get that player agency is a huge deal, um, and that it will it will shred some people and suck all their fun out if they feel like they're they're. They're being sock puppets in you, the keeper's performance. You know what I mean? That's what you got to avoid is making them feel like, you know, you're running this thing as the keeper and they're just there to be the audience or to fill the roles that you've, you've created for them. You know what I mean? I, I, uh, I don't want my, I wouldn't want my players to feel like, you know, again, this is about entertaining me as opposed to entertaining. Oh yeah, of course. Um, I, I will say I've spoken to this before. Um, the reason fatalism and uh, high violence, high body count works is because it causes human reactions for people playing PCs to make sense and to be intuitive. I don't run in the room because the man has a double-barreled shotgun. I don't, you know, I don't stick my hand in the monster's mouth or crawl into the roiling shadows on the wall because I might die. Um, the moment you detach physical danger and mental danger from anything that even remotely is realistic, um, you get inhuman responses from your players. They go, oh, well, I can take seven shotgun blasts before it's mm -hmm. really a problem. So I run into the room and save the guy. Um, and then handlers or GMs go, why didn't that work? Like, <laughs> I had a hostage scenario and it totally didn't work in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Well, you're all fourth fucking level and it doesn't fucking matter how many crossbow bolts you get shot at you, you're fine. Um, you know, so that's an important part of this. Uh, you have to feel mortal and you have to feel at risk because that's where the fun comes from, the risk. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, there's got to be, there's absolute, that, and so far we've managed to maintain that, uh, that, uh, that level of risk, that, uh, that genuine feeling that, you know, um, uh, you are not Aragorn, kids. You are not the <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, um, there, you know, uh, you, if anything, you were one of those 300 orcs they killed in a single sentence before Aragon <laughs> saw a blade of grass that reminded him of a song that goes <laughs> yeah. on for the agent, you know? Sam, um, come sit on my knee. I'm going to sing. Yep. Uh, anyways, next question. All right. Uh, hydrogen. Unless Shane's got something. Shane, do you have oh, anything Shane's got something. Yeah, what now? Oh, no, no. You, no, go ahead. Hydrogen. Let's hear it. All right. Hydrogen asks. Good to hear from you, Hydrogen. Uh, what advice would you give for striking a compelling balance between mythos threats that are immune to a player's abilities to stop and or kill them, and those which the players can actually foil and or kill and or stop? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I certainly have it's, thought on this, but... 
It, it's pretty easy. Um, you should not be directly dealing with miso, mythos threats a lot. You should be yeah. dealing with taint, tainted humans who have been exposed to mythos threats and perhaps have abilities they can carry back. Killing a, a, a guy who has a crazy equation in his head or, you know, uh, dealing with a person who could make illusions, uh, who's hiding in plain sight. These become achievable goals for Delta Green. He's not bulletproof. He just can look like anybody. That's a something you can solve for. Um, but when you do confront the monsters, it should build. That should be a significant, holy crap, what's this kind of yeah, thing that, so that should be that should be that should be cataclysmic and and if if somehow the agents overcome it they ought to feel like you know oh my god what yeah, just happened to, what just happened yeah. here how did, how did that happen that's ridiculous that's insane well most of our i mean most of our mythos i mean are really entertaining and serious mythos threats are the ones that are more hyper geometric than they are meat i mean okay deep ones you know you can drop a depth charge on them you can if you yeah. can find them you can absolutely shoot a ghoul or a serpent man or whatever but um once you're getting into some of these other things like just just the migo i mean it's what in the book an 11 11 dimensional in the short story it's what 11 dimensional entity of which we can perceive three of the dimensions of it, so there's eight dimensions that are completely off our ability to interact with. So, how are we going to shoot it again? Yeah, and in yeah, what? Yeah. You know, does it, um, does it even mean anything to shoot it? Is the I mean, clearly there was one that was washed away in a river, but do we know what happened to it? Is it? Do they just drown? Why would it drown? Or <laughs> did something else happen to it that? You know, yeah, I mean, you know, is, just, is it is that even amigo? Like, who knows? Mm -hmm. it could be, yeah. it could be a fucking tote bag that amigo carries around in the fifth dimension yeah. that it dropped. <laughs> it could, you know, like, who knows? But, but, but certainly, where, 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 saying, no. where are my where are my fucking seven dimensional keys? God damn it! <laughs> you said, Dennis, that this is not a game where the player should ever believe that every encounter is going to be balanced for gameplay. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's any, any not encounter a, is going to be balanced. Yeah. Like you, you um, need gotta, the, I, the, the real challenge is to me is is communicating to players often enough that they internalize it that um, if they do something that would seem dangerous to them as human beings, then it's going to be yeah. dangerous to their characters. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so um, uh, the only thing I would say is that you know they're talking about his question uses the phrase. Uh, stop slash kill foil slash kill and you know um when it comes to this sort of stuff i would i feel like for you know if there is anything like game balance i am not going to I, for my for my i'm not going to write a scenario where okay i've created this uh horrible creature uh it's completely new uh to uh delta green there is no way to determine its weakness i've given it one but there's nothing in the scenario that will allow you to find this out um, and go. And I just, that seems like a way to alienate players. I mean, it's not realistic that there's going to be clues that are going to necessarily lead to undoing this completely alien problem. I mean, that's a bit like the big red self-destruct button that's right there in Blofeld's, you know, right. volcano right. base, just begging for... James Bond right. to push it and blow it up. Why would this be included? I was going to say this. This didn't. This didn't get to be a two billion year old immortal uh, cosmic threat. If any dumb yeah. monkey could kill it, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, yeah. certainly, I'd want to. You know, as a as the handler, want to include some ways that the players can foil the problem, and whether it's you know. It's and made this, clear in the original material that, that very specific conditions are required for some of these things to be here. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, I'm you just, can I'm just, remove some of those conditions. I, I just want to also say that um, resolving or defeating, most of the time, Delta Green has no idea whether it did that or not. Yeah, 
it's not here now. Mm-hmm. I think it's resolved. Yeah. We can all have coffee. Yeah. yeah. Well, drinks let's all go home. home. Quick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Be- before yeah. something shows up to, to show us that we really didn't fix the problem. Yeah. So, so a big thing, a big takeaway I would say there is absolute knowledge is an alien thing that does not exist in Delta Green on well, that's, any. That's very, that's very fair, Dennis. Just because you. Yeah. Moved the stone and now it's out of alignment. Right. This thing isn't allowed to be here anymore. Right. Okay. Can it come back? Will it come back? When yeah. will it come back? How many different stone circles like this are yeah. there out there? Yeah. I mean, that kind of thing. Yes, that's how you should resolve that kind of stuff. You should not give them absolute victories. Okay, we yeah. solved the ghoul problem. <laughs> you know, that's never yeah. going to happen. But yeah. at the same time, um, you know, uh, I, you know, for just constructing a story, just th- there's got to be, I feel like we do need to include things as writers that are going to be ways for them to uh, postpone, deflect, defer the threat. Sure, there's always, for a, there's always, there's always some ideal outcome whether or not it's actually a good outcome is completely kind of out there usually it's not usually it's you know well the person who started speaking in tongues from the dolna you know if you just kill her it'll take the spirit apparently a couple hundred years to find another target so we're good <laughs> you know and and delta green you know they're like oh yeah so they do that kill the 37 year old lady mother of two yeah just mm-hmm. we'll get back to you you know, tell us yeah. when you're done. That's what you bitching about. Do you know how many 37 year old mothers of two died <laughs> yesterday in the world? So yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's the fun. It's usually not the direct like we gotta kill the spirit. It's usually like, oh fuck, that's what this means. That's a terrible thing I have to do. So, anyway, yeah, just, just bear in mind what you know. Your your goal as the game master in a Delta Green game is not the same as it is in. Uh, you know, in in more heroically minded games, your yeah. goal here yeah. is to is to help get the players in a certain headspace. You know, to help mm-hmm. create tension that leads to this kind of these kind of moments of overwhelming terror. You know, and part of that often is building in events and encounters and things that are mortal and that the the agents can survive and deal with even if they confront them head on um as a as sort of uh as as a part of that up and down that cycle that eventually is going to build to something that's overwhelming right uh so i've got some questions here from uh ladius uh and it's also been somewhat mirrored in the chat a bit uh from xl jackbot Okay. Um, if, the- if you're if you're if you're asking when is my favorite book coming out, uh, no, the no, they're, is not. they're not. When it's done, yeah. <laughs> they they are not. Calm down. <laughs> uh, lady is asking. Look, look at him. Like- he, it's it's driving him to drink. He just he reached immediately <laughs> for the water bottle, you know, <laughs> to make the thinky pain go away. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so keeping the system lightweight and fast has been one of its strengths, but have you ever had ideas on how to expand on it, even slightly optional rules for specific situations, etc.? And then uh, XL Jackpot has asked a little bit about... Um, uh, oh, so, sorry, that was not XL Jackpot. I'll get to your question in a second. Uh, but about the second edition mechanics you are excited about. We've also had a question about that. I wouldn't well, spill it. Was, we always have it. No, not spilling it? Okay. What, what was the first not- question? Uh, first one oh. is if you had any ideas on expanding uh, rules for specific situations. Of course, uh, we, we've got a bu- we've got a bunch of optional rules in on, across multiple Patreons. Yeah, you know, I mean, stuff that that stuff sometimes makes its way into particular scenarios and campaigns. But mm-hmm. um, with the core game, we went through a really long, um, exhaustive process of. Um, of coming up with ideas and then attacking them to see which ones could survive, you know, like, um, like a and that's how, up. and that's, yeah. And that's how we got the game to be kind of lightweight and uh, flexible. 
Yeah. All right. Uh, cool. Yeah. I, when I come up with new stuff, it's normally because I need a way for the game to work. Like I'm trying to do a, mm-hmm. I'm trying to do a submarine deep dive thing now, and like if it's just a athletics roll to swim. <laughs> Right. You are what yeah. like anything that goes wrong at 500 meters in the bottom of the Black Sea goes wrong permanently. Like right. that is a one and done roll. <laughs> like right. so, so you're not going to get to the scenario. Right. At that point. Right. Like, I'll put some yeah, that, intervening that, yeah, system there. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's one of those things where you've got to ask yourself really carefully: Do I want? One of these guys to fumble because you know one of them's going to fumble. Yeah, right. If you right. give it them the opportunity so to much. fumble, they're going to fumble. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, okay, uh, we had a question about from this one from his XL Jackpot. Um, uh, inspired by Iconoclast and Jack Frost, has more organizational troop play ever come up as a possibility for a campaign scenario design? You mean like mass combat? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. I, I think they probably they probably mean having um, having multiple teams, right? Uh, Where yes. the same yeah. players play in, in oh. Iconoclast. You know, you've got the the players may in one session play the intelligence guys, and then another session play the hitters. In Jack Frost, you know, you've got a separate team I, for the yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah. I really I really liked both those scenarios but it's not my cup of tea writing wise it's not what i do um so that would be shane or scott i think um because they're really military minded really organizational minded um and i think there's a lot of stuff to mine there that is still open um so i think yeah i think there's a big opportunity there uh, to play multiple teams across a single operation or something like that um, well, the, the, so, yeah. it is the difference. It is the difference between the program and the outlaws, or the or right. program and the and the cowboy era, is that mm-hmm. there. It's big enough to have specialization, right? And so we shouldn't ignore that as an option. We should not send the virologist on the on the building breach mission. You know, right? Right. There's no point we to, will. But we probably you shouldn't. I, now, and I and I get why the virologist ended up doing the building breach in the cowboy days, or even with, their, with the outlaws, because that's it. That's all they have to bring to the table is a twitchy virologist. Um, but uh, the program has got more resources than that, and so it's. I, I just feel like we, you know, it makes more sense to split that up. Now, the the trick is. You don't want to have. I, I don't want to end up with a situation where there's so many. The, the players have so many characters that they are that in in their I don't know quiver of player characters that suddenly the the risk means nothing anymore. It doesn't have the same. Yeah. Uh, they don't. They don't I feel the same. Please let me run the DG peasant funnel. Like, just let me yeah, send yeah, waves yeah. of them into the portal. <laughs> right. Well, and I mean that's 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 why that's why this is this kind of thing has been the exception and not the rule. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. um, where where there's a really compelling reason to uh, to have mul- multiple kinds of experiences, then let the players play multiple kinds of experiences. But as a game thing. You know, if you do that a lot, if you do that as the, all the time, then you sort of dilute the experience and you dilute the the power of this is my character and oh my god, what's happening to this character this week? Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and and you you risk you know if you bring if you sort of let Delta Green. Um, Throw lot as the game master. If you let Delta Green uh, help the players out too much, which is usually to say at all, then um, then you kind of uh, pull back some of the suspense and some of the frustrations that ought to be front and center to what they're mm-hmm. doing. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so that's why you know we set it up in the in the handler's guide that. Uh, your, your agents, you know, th- there's there's not a Delta Green SWAT team that's going to come in and fix things every time your agents want want something, you know, or, or like, oh, 
but this is a shooty thing. I, I can't shoot people. I'm I'm a precious scientific pearl. Um, no, you're, you're on the ground. You're the one doing it. You're trying to foist this experience off on somebody else that's not briefed for it yet. Well, the you kind know, of and, and, is that? The, you deal with this shit. The, the one time that Dennis uh, presented that in a scenario on Owl's Head Mountain, you can have yeah. the shooters come in. They're just going to fuck it up. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and we've, we've you know, had that yeah. with the thing that Caleb wrote. Yeah, recently. I, yeah, I do, I do organizational stuff all the time. I love it because there's a rational caution in Delta mm -hmm. Green, and I find that there's always at least one player in a group who's very keen to stay behind. I'll run comms. Don't you worry. Yeah. <laughs> the I'll guy be in the, chair. the HQ in the nerve center, making sure you're all... And the, there's nothing more I love than, like, allowing them to make that split, allowing them to make every plan they can about how this character's gonna be safe, but this one's going in the Derek Do, and then fucking both of them, just at the same time... As horrifically as I possibly can think of, that I, that that's what I like for organizational. I'm trying to do it again in a different scenario, <laughs> so I I like that because um, I think it's great when you have like. There's nothing for me organizationally worse than when I really need something from my boss or my higher ups or something like that, and I come in to find them as panicked, if not more, like out of it than I am. Um, because that is not comforting to anyone. Oh, no, daddy's not supposed to cry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, I think you can do some good role playing, switching back and forth between that. But yeah, it takes a lot more work than just a straightforward go get it um, mm -hmm. cell structure. Yeah, I mean, in in Jack Frost, the, the key, the key is is to make sure that uh, if you let them bring in specialists. You know, who can really handle this kind of situation, they can't handle that kind of situation. You know, Jack Frost, you play the, the heaviest of heavy hitters, they still can't handle the situation. It's just they're in the middle of a disaster. Yeah, God's breath, you find the heavy hitters, and then all of the targets behave like Dennis says the people in other games behave. Like, I could probably take seven shotgun blasts if I <laughs> charge into that room with <laughs> clippers. Yeah, um... Uh, okay, yeah, these questions. It's up there with it's up there with red snow. The entire you're in a team of heavy hitters. Yeah. And, oh, we're going in with a company of Spetsnaz, and we have a portable tactical yep. nuke. Oh yeah, we're all going to die. Yeah, we're not making yeah. it out of here. This is not. Yeah, gonna I'm, we got. I'm gonna. Yeah, we need to find a way to to put uh, to to put to bring that scenario back back into play. You're the one you did for a uh, cold dead hand is what I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. Cold dead oh, hand. Yeah. Scott. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, go ahead. Don't uh, forget right. to pay me again to republish it. I'll I won't stop you. <laughs> Man, there's always a fucking catch with this crew. <laughs> there really is. What happened to the joy? Just That's doing right. it for the sheer joy. <laughs> uh okay, these are kind of related. Uh Horton Fears a coup asks <laughs> Uh, awesome. I'm, a, I'm a handler, and all my agents are native to the greater DC area. I've been trying to localize okay, I'm this. I'm really scenario. nervous. No, wait a minute. Horton <laughs> fears a coup is, <laughs> is a native to the DC area. It makes sense. Uh, Where do you think it's going to take place? Um, okay. uh, what do you recommend for making a scenario feel like it takes place in a specific area and related? Um, John Turtle asks, I love DG and the gritty realism it portrays especially considering contemporary subjects like intelligence and politics, but also computer science, cybersecurity, and modern-day application of science. I personally don't know a lot about these things, programming computers, or anything of the like. Um, how do I run convincing, engaging games for people who do? How do I run the last equation for math and physics PhDs? Our insulin <laughs> impulse for something programming in cybersecurity. So this is your all, your verisimilitude clearinghouse. Go, go <laughs> now. And I can just straight up say that when I run the last equation or, you know, observer effect with the crazy computer or uh, that was the one that had the crazy AI, near mm -hmm. AI computer, right? Observer yeah. effect chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whenever I run something like that, you know, I, I'm describing a, a Stephen King or a thriller novel. I, I'm not a scientist. I don't know anything about why the Curtis equation should fold space or anything like that. I made it up. Um, and if you have someone at your table going, well, you know, Bayesian 
Bernie's also say, you know, that they're probably not a person who are, is going to have a lot of fun at the table for last equation. Um, if they take offense but, but, to fictionalizing but they, things. Or, mm-hmm. But if they are the kind of person who wants to have fun, they're going to dip into their specialized knowledge and they should oh, yeah. be volunteering ways to make it worse. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, totally. well, that's what yeah. you hope for. And those that, and, that's and, terrific. And, yeah. If you can get your subject matter experts to go, how could this be worse? You know, yeah. and or you it, know, it is, even better. How how could this be? You know, real. Like, how mm-hmm. would you make this feel more real? How would you? The people who join in are the best, and the people who whine and complain and argue everything are the worst, and they're really hard to deal with. So I feel your pain. I'm sure you've had them. Everybody's had one of those guys at the table. You know, most of the can't, can't fire, you know, shut the fuck up. I don't care. <laughs> like, that's not what this is about. Um, you know, I've, I've seen that. I've seen that pretty rarely myself. Uh, maybe I've just been lucky. But oh, um, shit, Shane. usually, <laughs> usually, usually if people sure. are, you know, if, are you if, people, if people come to the game and they know, yeah, I mean. I don't know. People come to the game with a certain with a certain idea, and and there that means, in my experience, usually they're on board with helping to deliver what they came here to experience. About, as opposed about to half the games, about the half the games I've ever run at cons ha- have had at least one player who not only that they usually don't know what Delta Green is, or they actively showed up to ruin the game because they dislike what Delta Green is. And no. well, they, those, those guys, I don't know who that yeah. is. Yeah, well, I, uh, I, you were I, in one of the I, you were in one of the games where we had I? the guy who was yeah. Was I doing that? A, Sorry, man. I no, 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 no. It wasn't you. It was one of the. Remember one of the little <laughs> games I ran. I think it was uh, Sentinels of Twilight. Um, and we all sat and kind of did that. And there was one guy who was like the radio. You know, he's basically going on about radio equipment for like four hours. In a scenario that neither needs you to transmit radio or receive radio, like it doesn't even enter into the fucking scenario. Yeah. So I was constantly like, "Why are we talking about crystal radios in the middle of a thing about twenty-one foot tall invisible guys trying to eat us?" Or something? Sometimes like, you're gonna, sometimes um, you're gonna get the Aspergers going on. Yeah. So, and so you just have to kind of roll with it and say, "Come on, we're gonna deliberately bring this back on course." You're being that yeah, kind of I, thing I, again. That was that whole game, though. So, um, but what I would say, high level, is you're not pitching a reality; you're pitching a fiction. Um, you know, yeah. you 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 are trying to spin a tale and to tell them your agent feels this way about this. You know, uh, it creeps you out because of X, Y, and Z. You're painting a picture of horror. You're not explaining <laughs> the, the reality of the map or uh, the computer stuff. And I would high level stuff. I, I do this all the time, you know. Oh, I try and hack the computer. Just whatever you go into it, just assume for computer science, it's really easy. Everything you've ever seen on TV is bullshit. Um, the the people are, when they try and hack a computer or something like that, it is 99% of the time a nightmare that produces nothing. Um, and getting caught is really easy, and it's My very hard. My is still two people practice. typing on the same keyboard. That is, that is the gold standard. <laughs> yeah. For uh, for um, Hollywood unless hacking. they unless they work at that place in Vancouver, in which case they hacked it instantly. Right. You're just you're you're trying to build and maintain a mood. That that is your job as the handler. Less information dumps, more mood and feeling around the table. Yeah, and as long as you don't you know cock up. I mean, when you blow when you okay, I get that you can blow. All right, Dennis. You know, as somebody who lived in the New York area. Yeah. If you if somebody presented a situation where a character, you know, walks a block and they go from the Upper East Side to Greenwich Village, yeah. uh, you're Every like, movie. no, no, <laughs> yeah. that is not how, I mean, that's, I, I always had that problem yeah, but, walking but, but during but, but during the game, if he's the handler, I'm not going to go, well, I'm, I'm in fucking Chinatown right now, motherfucker. You told me I went four blocks north, of, you know, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that because I sure. it's the game. But um, at the same time, you know, you just, you, if, if 
you work with the you work with your subject matter experts to get that that little bit of yeah it shouldn't matter that uh, it, it, some of these details shouldn't matter but maybe it does how long does it take to get from the upper east side to Greenwich yeah, Village yeah. you know yeah yeah maybe if, that's important if you, yeah if you boof it if you if you as the handler completely fuck it up and the subject matter expert explains why that's important um listening to them backpedaling and going oh okay cool yeah shit you're right like it would be this that's there's nothing lost in there that's that's a victory for the handler if you do that um and just try and remember it for later uh but yeah yes oh, especially <laughs> when we're talking about play testing you know as opposed to a published it's already out the gate and we've already married yeah. ourselves to it um yeah but as long as you've as long as you're trying to sell an area like a place um like dc you got friends who are all in dc then I, I don't see what the problem is you're also familiar with that environment you're all going to be able to know the difference between you know being on the the national mall and and that or or being in brentwood you know the brentwood neighborhood of dc which is apparently a free fire it's like beirut or something it has that reputation you're gonna they're all gonna know that that thing the trick is selling alien environments to people yeah. you know yeah I would, how are you I gonna would, sell yeah. yeah how are you gonna sell mosul how are you gonna sell um uh new york city to people who've never been there and then you're right dennis it's all about mood it's all about painting an, uh, uh, an environment they can feel in their skin that's about theme and mood yeah we put you know, we, 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 as writers for Delta Green Books, we put a lot of effort into detail and into kind of minutia in order to provide the GM with tools that they can use to put the players' heads where their characters are. But mm -hmm. that's a different challenge than just running a game for your friends, you know? Yeah, um, most of the issues don't actually come up. Like you mentioned in incident impulse and like cybersecurity. Levi has like a 90 in computer science on there, and you guys were asking if you could get some information off IMDB. And I'm like, yeah, he works. <laughs> he works. <laughs> he the details. He's got a 90 in the NSA. I think he can crack the fortress that is IMDB. Are we talking about IMD Pro? Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh well, wow. that's that's different. We're gonna have to throw one of those football fields full of crazy. <laughs> yeah, like awesome. the other thing is like so many people who don't know about this stuff don't know about this stuff and are bad at it. Like I did in God's Law. Like one of the things you miss in the autopsy is just because a thing that happens all the time in autopsies happens. They didn't have staffing to flip the guy over. He was bigger than the nurse or the forensics, and they didn't look on his back because he's fucking heavy and he's dead. Like and like that's not. That's not Sherlock Holmes. That's like right. being the dude who flips the corpse over, even though you're right, pretty right. sure you got it all by now. Like, yeah. Uh, so, and I mean, in that case, you just tell the, you know, it's like if you've got a, an agent who's good at forensics, it might occur to them, yeah, you know, yeah. to check on this that. wasn't thorough. You, you, you yeah, you right. Tell the agent. Yeah, I mean, that's well, we that's we we just Brian Appleton just threw that at us in a Wild West scenario where we've got a dead guy with his throat cut in a bed. You know, and uh, there is absolutely blood everywhere. And there's no doubt about what the cause of death is. And I'm like, fuck it, we're turning him over. And yes, all the terrible things we didn't want to see <laughs> were on the backside of the corpse. Of but, course. You know, of course it was. But, you know. Yeah. This is, it's Appleton we're talking about. So, of course, it was hidden underneath his ass. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, the Sphere, another joint conjoined question. Uh, the Sphere asks, are there elements of the mythos you found are a bad fit for Delta Green setting or tone? And then a bad feeling asks, what is, in your opinion, the least scary, lamest traditional cosmic horror Lovecraft monster or antagonist? And how would you attempt to make them scary or interesting in play? So I mean, shit, is, there, is there a B team? Is anybody on the, the Little League, like the kids <laughs> table? Not so a lot of tea yeah, there's there's plenty. There's plenty of them. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're all they're all pretty stupid when you think about it. Um <laughs> the 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 key is to make them not stupid. And 
you know, honestly, we'll, we'll charge you a Kickstarter in the future to show you how we do that. I'm um, not going to break down like, here's how you take out to Thoa and make him really interesting. Um, I mean, you know, just remember uh, your goal is is to be spooky and scary and yeah, make your make your players vicariously sad. Uh, Rats in the Wall made me laugh until I read From the Dust, and I was like, okay, maybe maybe human yeah. face oh. rat guys are a little Thanks. scary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, the, you know, you can you can run deep ones, and they're just stupid as hell right yeah like yeah. If, if if the if what if what the if what the if what deep ones are bringing is you know you ever hear tell a fish rape you know then <laughs> that's gonna well, get old one, really fast the yeah, one, but, one the, the deep the deep ones i'm running right now are you know meth heads um who you know they're basically agents run into them and they realize that the the director is paying attention because, you know, they brought one in with gills on his ribs, all methed out with scabs all over his body, and they're selling meth basically. So they're people, like <laughs> is is the pitch there for the deep ones? Um, they're they're warped and ruined and horrible and changing, but they're still people. Um, but as far as making stuff interesting, it's never hard. Um, there's so much leeway in all these ideas. Cthulhu is. You know, I, I always, you know, it's a, it's a dragon headed, you know, dragon with a squid head that marches around. You know, that's just so stupid. It, it, um, it's Godzilla. Uh, you know, on, yeah, on its surface, yeah, yeah. it looks like a just typical. Yeah, kaiju. and that's and that's the least interesting thing about Cthulhu mm -hmm. as an entity. Right. right. So you know, we immediately jump off from there and just start a mountain you know, walks and stumbles kind of it. We made it our own thing. I think we do that with everything. And I think it's really easy for you to do that at, at home as a handler, grab the elements uh, and shake it around and find the stuff that makes you squeamish. Like what, what about a deep one might upset you? Um, if you, you know, if you're looking at a complete bog standard vanilla baddie and you want to make it interesting, what, what could make that compelling to you? What would make you fearful? Is it a you know a second row of shark teeth beyond his normal rotten teeth um, that you discover after you shoot him and he's dead on the ground? Would that fucking creep you out? Um, work on that, you know. Start with that yeah. and move on from there. Yes. Do they now have that second set of jaws like a moray eel? Or yeah, 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 yeah. Or is it? You know, I mean, the thing, the thing that the thing that I find, you know, that I find creepy with with uh, with deep one stuff is. They're, um, you know, you're talking about you're talking about creatures that are smarter than we are as a species. You know, they see things differently than we than we do, and they, uh, you know, they 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 don't grow old and die, right? Mm -hmm. So if lots you run of, into lots of one, time to acquire. They yeah, lots of time if, to if, acquire if, experience. And talent. Right, right, and and to know that you you know. If you want to keep not growing old and dying, then you don't put yourself in a position where that dude with the rifle can pull a trigger on you, right? You use mm -hmm. the fact that you've got two or three of these weird spells and a bigger brain than them and a totally different relationship with reality than them to um, to get what you want and not get it, not have not be in the way of these idiots with badges. Well, it helps that they've spent the last, I don't know, what, millions of years where we could never penetrate their world. We couldn't. Mm -hmm. The technology wasn't there, but they could penetrate ours anytime they got the desire to. Um, the idea that the 20th century and bathospheres and submarines and aqualungs have suddenly put the monkeys into their environment, I mean... Certainly, that would have been a bit of a shock for them when it happened. But the idea that they didn't adapt and right. yeah, immediately yeah. figure out a way to fix that little problem—that um, yeah. doesn't make any sense. They—they—they they, they didn't just stand there and take it. They've obviously done new things to reassert their control and keep themselves safe. Um, Until I don't now, think I've run into the Nautilus Two made out of PVC pipe I found out of the back of Boeing. <laughs> <laughs> can go five thousand meters deep. We'll that never shot. did. <laughs> I mean, it did. I mean, what do you? It probably went you, even you deeper. It sound like the guy was lying. It went. It absolutely. <laughs> went. Yeah. Um. 
But, uh, you know, I don't think I've run across anything from the, unless it's, you know, Sweet Ermine, what was the terrible romance not story that Lovecraft wrote? Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. Some of his, some of his that's terrible ter- that's poetry. Ter- that's terrifying for other reasons. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Sweet Ermine Guard. Sweet Ermine yeah. Guard. Except oh, for trying to yeah. turn that into a story yeah. or, yeah. you know, whatever. Med- Med- um, Medusa's Coil. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's all kinds of. Uh, I haven't run across anything that didn't have something in it that we could, you know, get out use, and polish yeah. and find a way to use it. Um, uh, I'm when they say what's the lamest, uh, it always felt like in published scenarios and other stories, uh, good old Nodens came off pretty lame, which is why I went and found a way to make Nodens less lame. At least I hope I did. And, you know, the, the first thing is the idea that, wait, he's, he's, or Nodens or it is Narlothotep's nemesis. Right. It is, it's, it's permanent opponent. That, how did you think that made it a good guy? Right. right. I mean, the elder things fought the star spawn. That yeah. didn't make any of them the good guy. Um, why would it? Why would it? Nodens fighting Narlathotep make it the good guy? And um, going back into the original, uh, the the weirdness about that site at Lindsay that 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 Nodens is discovered at just amazed me. Going back to the original site that. Lovecraft picked up this name because he was aware of the news and saw this name and it sounded cool. So he used it. But then, holy shit, uh, we've got, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien doing a breakdown of where the name comes from and actually publishing it back in the 19, I guess, 30s. And, and it's not, it's, it's more than just a, a hoary old Celtic god. It's a crippled, maimed god that the Romans conflated with uh, war and fear. And so it suddenly becomes the god of crippled, maimed soldiers um, and warriors. That suddenly makes it awful. Now you've got all kinds of ways to make it awful. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, I'm really happy with that. I'm really happy with that treatment right now. I hope I'm, I'm just going to be... I'm hoping that other people will be as delighted with the way that Noden stopped being, yeah, he's a guy in a clamshell with a dolphin and a beard who shows up and <laughs> fixes fixes things when the players have fucked up, you know, which is how he was presented in a lot of chaos. Gives you a big cartoon wink of approval when he before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, um, uh. you know uh, so yeah, that seemed pretty, that seemed pretty lame. Um you know, we'll have to see what we can do with some of the uh, the old gods of Earth, other old gods of Earth of the Dreamlands, and see what, you know, we can make out of them. Uh, they seem kind of lame. I'm sure we can do something terrible with them to make everybody unhappy. Sure. I made sure Bass was uncomplicated and just loved you like a cat and everything. Yeah. Fine. Don't worry about yeah. it. It's just great. Follow your nose. Bass is on your side. Um, mm-hmm. And look, Bast wants, to, leg. Bast <laughs> yeah. wants to kill terrible things. That how what could be worse than how I mean, bad, it's, all, it's killing bad things. That makes it a good thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. So more related questions. So Zach asks, would you consider putting out a supplement that goes into more detail on the program structure relation to the rest of the federal government? Bureaucracy, notable people. And then we also have uh, from Helonymous, is there the slightest chance that we will get something like a DG lore encyclopedia or an index that shows the appearances of creatures, characters, and organization? Isn't that uh, what the Fairfield Project is? That's a fan website if people don't yeah, know. I'll just say the, fir- the first one, uh, we have a book planned. Uh, yes. That deep state, right? Yeah, um, isn't Deep State going to do that? Yeah, yeah, that'll that'll be one of the cha- one of the chapters. We'll be doing exactly that. The second one, we have we have a lot of groundwork for an encyclopedia. Like Caleb did this nightmarish uh, breakdown of all the operations and all the agents and all the stories and in a giant spreadsheet. Uh, you know, maybe one day we'll 
cut a check oh, for Mr. Hey, Height and you just bastard. Yeah, yeah, just get Ken Knight to do it. Every every fictional operation mentioned in Delta Green lore, yeah. named well, and unnamed, including in the including in the fiction, including all the, in everything, the every, yeah. everything, everything, you even the even ones that are not canon. <laughs> So, yeah. so we have a lot. Even, we have even, a lot even of, Dios los muertos. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of groundwork already covered. You know, so an encyclopedia of lore, you know, that's attractive to me as an idea. But we're our our dance cards are full. Um, mm -hmm. So if something like that were to happen, it would probably be a Kickstarter on its own, and we'd probably hire Ken Height. Hey, Ken, how yeah. you doing? Or, it sounds or, right or Dan rally. Harms or something. Dan you know. Harms or yeah, somebody who's good at this that's, sort of thing. That's I will guy. say, if you want access to that, um, it's a concordance, so I put where I found the mention of every single operation on the spreadsheet. So if you want that, you can Dan, get it on Dan's the work is already half head done. channels. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, all right. So Pat asks: the Misery Engine's bond mechanic works incredibly well for creating stakes in long form play. Have you looked into creating other settings that would benefit from a similar mechanic? Dark dungeon style fantasy, Deadwood esque Western. I would add godlike. Is the is are we getting can we start hating our families from afar mm -hmm. in the Italian <laughs> theater with superpowers? Um how, how oh, do you, yeah, how all, do you all, think all of the all of the above, yeah. Um yeah, I mean I've 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 got a uh I've got a horror uh horror western game that um that uh where bonds feature pretty heavily um and uh and it was uh, and it went great you know the um yeah. it's, the, it's uh, a nice one, mechanic one, one of the you know one of the players one of the players said that that year long uh play test that we did was uh how did he put it some of the uh best role playing he's ever he's ever experienced which was a very nice thing to say um and yeah, I mean that's you know it, it it works out there because the bonds in that case are more about the relationships between the player characters than about their um, people back home because this is a weird frontier setting where nobody really has a back home anymore. Um, but making sort of front front loading the uh, the way that trauma uh, damages interpersonal relationships and the way that interpersonal relationships can protect you from trauma uh, fits in really, really well. Um, certainly fits in really well, like you said, with godlike, you know, with the, with the World War II um, setting and, uh, and dark fantasy. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm running a dark fantasy campaign uh, right now with its own rule set that um, one of the, one of the, one of the things I'm working on in that is, bringing in sort of a version of those rules to represent the way that um, this is a military thing. So to represent the way that uh, soldiers in um, traumatic combat have a seem to have a tendency to sort of buddy up, you know, you find, you find, you know, your best buddy who you get to know and who you can rely on and, you know, everybody knows it's you too, um, and that's great, unless they, uh, you know, take an arrow to the throat. Yeah, I, uh, you know, it's one of those things where I, I mean, I've never thought about any standalone games using this stuff, but I've always thought that if anyone was running Fourth Edition Twilight Two Thousand, you you should absolutely staple the bond stuff onto that setting because mm -hmm. you know it that setting just didn't have enough uh of the trauma in mm -hmm. it i mean it, okay it's a gritty combat system but you know it leaves all the internal damage the psychological damage just kind of stays on the floor it never really they never really picked that up and even in the latest edition they have it and stapling the bonds and uh, sanity system to that would make for a much more interesting game to me than simply do we have enough, you know, cans of uh, food to get through the next week. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I read that in the playtest draft I got and ripped it off in red markets before the RPG even got published. <laughs> I like that <laughs> nice. system so much. Nicely yeah. done, but yeah. For the yeah. dependence, yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. That, yeah. Good. So, but, of, but of course, you just blew it now. You've revealed your secret. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. The IP well. law, your, your horde of IP lawyers are coming for you. <laughs> Shane, rip me off is what you should have opened with. Yeah. He read uh, Red Markets and just ran with it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, that wouldn't hold up in court. No one's read all of Red Markets. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm good on questions from my patrons, and thank you very oh. much for them. Um, does yeah. anybody have any questions in the chat for us? Uh, I'm going to scroll up a little bit. I uh, think you did. You did you uh, nix the thing about top three tips for running Delta Green? I think you've given more than three at this point. Uh, we've, yeah. got, we've got many three at this point. Yeah, uh, it was a good question, but it's covered. Uh, Excel Jack, the, my, my my number one tip: read the handler's guide. Yeah. <laughs> uh, buy another copy. First, read that one again. Buy yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. 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 So first step: buy the no, handler's no, guide. Read it. Is the, <laughs> is the step nobody wants to take? Sorry, I'm being a, I'm being a bitch. Go ahead. No. <laughs> Uh, XL Jackpot asks, what is Miskatonic University doing right now? Uh, I, turning I, out I'm undergraduates. Writing, <laughs> I, I, I'm actually writing about them in the operational history right now. Um, yeah, they're, they're not doing anything Delta Greeny, I wouldn't think. Um, yeah, I mean, it, sh it, it shows up in the labyrinth. Yeah, but I mean, it's not, it's not like, let's go to the team at Miskatonic. Like, it's, you know, it's, we need a professor who can speak speak Middle English fluently to look at this. Um, you know, maybe. yeah, Miskatonic always it always struck me as as sort of um, that was a wound that Delta Green knew they could cauterize pretty early on. Yeah, yeah. So so there's so I think there's I think there's plenty of there's plenty of space as a as a GM to um, to to bring up. Uh, stuff that got lost, you know, um, Armitage's papers that Delta Green didn't manage to steal and hide away somewhere in Joe Camp's basement. Um, well, I mean, in, in the official lore as of now, P4 becomes deeply involved with the Antarctic discoveries, with mm -hmm. the elder things, you know, with the, with the city, with you know, they, they, the Office of Naval Intelligence sponsors birds flight over it Antarctica with some, you know, iffy, like, search for giant pyramids. If you see them, let us know. Kind of thing. <laughs> um, and there's a Miskatonic desk that exists to study Professor Lake's findings and all this other kind of stuff. But I assume that's all wrapped up with a bow in 1942 when the OSS gains control of P4 and everything like that. Yeah. Um, you know, so suddenly and suddenly they have wartime powers to make everything. Yeah, poof. yeah, they can make it all vanish. Um, you know, <laughs> so I don't imagine a deep and storied history between Delta Green P4 and Miskatonic <laughs> University. Um, Maybe you some know. alumni in the early years. Yeah, I mean that's certainly possible. And you know, linguists and magics, you know, people who have studied magical tomes and shit like that would certainly come in handy in the 40s and such, but I don't think it would be, you know. But there's, there's yeah, not Delta Green be any, wouldn't, Delta Green wouldn't be, be a, encouraging, <laughs> uh, you know, the uh, uh, School of Medieval Metaphysics. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. No, there will not be a team up between a, a Delta Green, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> cell and the, what, Miskatonic... Uh, University Library overdue book retrieval squad. You know, that's just not going to happen. Right. Um. Yeah, the modern college landscape is pretty uh, anathema to the concept of Miskatonic University in of itself. Like, they could have, yeah. like, they could have the Rosetta Stone for speaking Enochian or something, and some private equity firm would bulldoze that wing of the library to put up a rock climbing wall. Like, <laughs> right. like, like capitalism is doing all the censorship of that old knowledge that we can ever hope for. Like, yeah, that, it's covered. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. Some more things. Uh, 
A question about uh, DG and other media. I'm not going to ask that one. We don't know. We don't have any control of it. Uh, people nope. try many times, and then then it doesn't go places. So we're not going to cover that. Correct. Uh, thank you for asking. It's not personal. We're just blah. Uh, what are your guys' main litmus tests for a good scenario idea? Uh, is it an act-like structure? Is it a progression? Is it pacing? No. Yeah. No. It's you random. It, 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 it's random. It could be nearly anything. Uh, very often from these guys, I see something that I just never saw before and go, holy fuck, that's awesome. Uh, Caleb did it with God's teeth. Uh, so there's no structure. There's no predefined thing. There's a theme and a feeling that a lot of people... I will say want to get but fail to get very easily because they're used to heroic based gaming and it, it's not a it's not a it's not them being evil or trying to ruin the game it's they're so used to well we go kill the monster and then we get the stuff and then we leave um, and so most of the scenarios I see submitted by external parties look something like that um, in, you mix up the elements, you know, we get the stuff, and then we kill the monster, and then we leave. Um, uh, so You know, Dennis, uh, we, we clearly have to set it up where we go get the, we shoot the monster and take the stuff. <laughs> That's the cold open. Fuck, yeah, and fuck that, that. the real pro the problem is you killed the monster and you took the stuff. Fuck, and then we can fuck, just, fuck that, that, where, that might where, work. Okay, I got one. We're the monster. We eat the stuff. <laughs> and then we leave. Um, no, I just... <laughs> Uh, so high level, what I would say is Delta Green is about tone and consistency. So if you read the Handler's Guide and it feels like you could insert the description of your scenario in the middle of the Handler's Guide, it wouldn't stand out like a sore thumb, you know. Oh, except for the jetpack clowns who show up in Act 3. Uh, you know, then it probably works. The second thing I'll say is... Um, unless it's throws... impossible landscapes, in which case you can have lots of jetpack Listen. clowns. Jetpack clowns are a central theme in Impossible Landscape, <laughs> so it's okay. But uh, the second thing I'll say is people often throw in too much. They, mm -hmm. It's 15 spells and a serpent folk and the Mego and a jet and, you know, just pick the, one the mythos, small thing and that's more than enough. Yeah. The mythos hoedown that we used to get back in yeah. the 80s. Yeah. 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 It's, it, it's fine to just, like, I'm going to make a scenario that's about the shriveling spell. That's it. Mm -hmm. Like that's 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 a like a five session scenario easy that's, if you're really, really having fun. Excellent. Oh yeah, yeah. That's I mean, really the, yeah. I wrote a uh, I wrote a, uh, a scenario called Hourglass, which is about this weird cult in rural Oregon, and most of that scenario is, as you say, about a single spell being used right. and the implications of that. And the implications of, you know, just how grody a person you'd have to be to keep using it in those circumstances, right. you know. Right. Um, and, and yet there's tons and tons of other shit happening around it. But, but by keeping that tight focus, you can sort of explore a lot of um, more mundane ground that has a lot more emotional punch to it, mm -hmm. right? Because it's more mundane. Yeah. yeah, we're running our third year of a campaign that started off with my idea of what if Randolph Carter had a podcast. So it doesn't have to be. <laughs> That's awesome. It doesn't have to be that deep um, to to get get a lot of. <laughs> have, have, you, have you dreamt about this man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. I love that idea. Uh, all right. So other questions. Uh, thank you for all the people saying nice things about dead channels in the chat. I would agree. That is the best Delta Green podcast existed on the internet. <laughs> Good job, Chad. <laughs> um, asked and answered. Um, Caleb. Caleb. Yeah. Not, not Delta Green related, but you may have seen earlier on in chat. Someone said Red Markets is my favorite uh, RPG I've never had the chance to play, and I've never felt more seen. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Wow. I, I don't know what that means. That's scary. Uh, yeah, Baz and I have a running joke. He's not allowed to play my game. I'm Everybody in the fucking book. I'm in the fucking book. <laughs> yeah, you can't play it. It's, it's going to be a separation. 
It's just art of you. Um, all right. I hate this place. I'm out of here. <laughs> all right. Uh, anyway, if you were to make a big MIG asks, if you were to make a Cowboys campaign set in the 1970s, what 70s must haves would you include? Cult serial killers. It's the DG decade. <laughs> well, I, I'm working on operational history right now, and I'm in the 70s uh, and the 80s, and and it's really it's a difficult task to capture a decade in a set amount of pages without with covering the vital operations and not really going far outside the lines. Uh, but yeah, 70s is about uh, turning inward, about uh, self actualization and ignoring other people's needs. It's it's the me decade in all the worst possible fucking ways, um, and it's about mind control and uh, you know it, it's all the awful shit, terrorism, blowing up planes, uh, cults, uh, sons of killing. Sam. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that's mm. my earliest memory is driving around in a Volkswagen in Brooklyn and my mom talking to my dad about getting her hair cut. Um, it, during the it, 76. So, like, Son of Sam shit. Um, but yeah, that kind of stuff is awesome. Um, yeah, so I would hit up all the classic themes of, of the 70s without going, you know, black exploitation, black killer kind of shit. Um, yeah. I wouldn't want and, and, and it's, weird. and you're, I mean, in the 70s and then in the, and, and continuing into the 80s, you're talking, you're, you're dealing with the, you should be dealing with the, um, aftermath. Of Delta Green blowing itself up, yeah. Right? The yeah all, of, of the- all of these horribly scarred people who don't have anything to do with their scars. Well, the, mm-hmm. yeah. The, the the other thing I I forgot to mention is the dissolution and the destruction of the federal government, um, mm-hmm. the falling apart of the urban centers, the collapse, of the American economy, uh, the end of we can do anything with uh, the end of Vietnam. Uh, it is that's all very real and creepy and um you know it's the it's the anti early 60s it's, mm-hmm. it's the opposite theme so i i love that stuff and i'm writing up a bunch well, of well now i i, I want to make sure to point out that three of the most delta green movies ever made are from the 70s three days of the condor marathon man and uh the parallax view I mean, yeah, I love the parallel. As far as as far as conspiracy thrillers, um, that's a really good time period to go fishing around yeah. for media inspirations uh, in that department. I think um, it, that those are those are some of the best as far as for 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 creating mood for creating oh, yeah. you know just that feeling of that feeling of dread. You know, well, pa- um, Parallax View is like straight up. Outlook group, like one hundred oh, yeah. billion percent outlook group. So you, you made that pretty clear. <laughs> yeah, I know it's awesome. I I love that movie, uh, and I just love the reveal at the end. I love everything about that film. Um, it, it's so good that you forget. You even forget that Warren Beatty is like the most gorgeous person on the planet. While he's in, in nineteen seventy uh, in, in seventy six or whatever that film. Yeah, was. you know he's like, yeah, you're. I'm a down on my luck reporter schlub. You're fucking Warren Beatty, man. Yeah, like, yeah, fucking, yeah. They're they're trying yeah. to Robert act Robert, Robert Redford pulls around. that shit off too back then. Yeah, especially. I, I, it was amazingly well done, and I remember thinking, shit, that was Warren Beatty, wasn't it? Like, <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. That's uh, yeah. That's seventy four and. Uh, uh, Marathon Man is 76, and uh, Three Days uh-huh. is, gosh, <laughs> um, 75. So that's right. three really good years for mm-hmm. incredible paranoia. Yeah, uh, shit, uh, boy, Boys from Brazil, uh, yeah. you know, the weird Nazi science kind of angle. Well, um, yeah, a, you're, you're going to have to get the, you're going to have to get the, uh, you, it's a time period when there's actually, you know, they're genuine Nazis. Original yeah, vintage o- OG Nazis ain't dead yeah. yet, and still vibrant enough to be punchable without being yeah. elder abuse. I mean, <laughs> sure you can push the ninety-seven year old Ukrainian camp guard down yeah. a flight I'll of stairs still. in his wheelchair, but it's not very satisfying. 
We'll still beat their ass, maybe. even if they're nine. Uh, yeah. Speak for yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fuck them. <laughs> fuck them. I can't. All right. It may be satisfying, but I can't, like, you know, clap myself on the back like I just knocked Max Schmeling down the third round. Okay. That's just pushing an old man down a flight of stairs. Yeah, but on those wheels, you can really get a run at it. Like, you can really get them <laughs> moving. Like, we'll give him some air. Yeah. He wants, you know, a good three or four feet before he hits the ground. <laughs> Uh, um, right. But uh, it's it you know it's it's certain a period when we are winding up to some of the best conspiracy stuff, uh, you know, uh, in that in that decade. We've got Jonestown happening down in uh, Guyana. We've got the hostage crisis. We've got uh, uh, any number of wacky things. Hell, the, the Russians invade Afghanistan. You know, seventy nine <laughs> is a particular. 79 is a particularly shocking year for yeah. wacky stuff that happens around the world, you know? Now I remember. Um, and it's also the end of, uh, it's also weirdly a period where we still have that kind of leftist terrorism. We haven't turned all of our terrorism into God yet, you know? Right. People are still, yeah. uh, uh, Barter Meinhof and the PLO are still, you know, yeah. these guys are leftist organizations, not right. uh, not religious cults, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I had the language skills and the history knowledge, there's something I'd really want to write it like taking place in Condor in the seventies, like just some American asshole in a disco shirt, walking around Rio discotheques, trying to solve like arcane mysteries while everyone else's department is like teaching, you know, militia psychos to throw people out of planes. Like God. Yeah. They had that part down pat. The yeah. part that we taught them was how to keep people alive <laughs> yeah. while you're interrogating. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, you know. so much evil shit in the seventies is going down across yeah. the world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Other questions? I think maybe one uh, more. Yeah, a lot of suppositions about Jimmy Carter knowing something. I agree. <laughs> he was in on it. He is way too nice. To that do. rabbit is a reliable. That rabbit was community. just that was a cover story. The rabbit was never <laughs> a rabbit. Oh, here's a great one to end on. Uh, okay. Who asked this? Where, I, I, I understood that reference, Scott. Thank you. Mm, where's it at? Where's it at? I don't remember who asked it, but it was the best question I've seen in a while. Uh, what what Halloween candy are you stealing from your children? And uh, what are you leaving behind? That's a good question to end on. Not your children, any children. Just passerbys in the street. When you're rummaging through their bags, what are you taking? What are you leaving? Uh, Rolos. Mm. Uh, Rolos are, are confiscated well, on this site. Is not a, this is not a good... Oh, Rolos, okay. Yeah, yeah, Rolos Confiscate solid. on site. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. the uh, uh, so Reese's cups. I'll I'll yeah. uh, steal some Reese's cups. I'll leave the Swedish fish behind. You can have those, kids. Mm. I, yeah, anything mm. but Rolos or Twix. I'll leave behind. My my kids actively hide those from me now. I have to search their pockets. <laughs> well, as a uh, practicing diabetic, I don't uh, confiscate <laughs> anybody's candy. Um. I, uh, you know, I might advise them to stay away <laughs> from the candy corn because that is useless and horrible and clearly is just, you know, barely flavored. Oh, surely the, na the neighborhood knows to stay away from the pagan house. Surely. Yeah. But um, we've only <laughs> nothing we've but only candy thrown corn. Boiling water. Yeah, we've only thrown boiling water on the kids once, <laughs> but they got the message. Practicing um, diabetic, would you consider so, yourself an orthodox diabetic? Uh, reform. Um, <laughs> orthodox requires injection. Yeah, you, you, orthodox you, requires you're injection. Joking. I know some unorthodox ass <laughs> diabetics <laughs> who are not following the faith. Yeah. How many, how many, can they count to 20? It's, it's <laughs> yeah. Because I can count to twenty-one, and I intend to keep it that way. <laughs> there you go. So I'm afraid I will have to. I will have to stare forlornly <laughs> at the uh, candy and uh, paint a miniature. Yeah. That's, the, yes. way, that's yeah. the only way I'm going to get that. It's the only way I'm going to get the that um, dopamine. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I'm going for Snickers, and I'm leaving anything out with mint and chocolate, two flavors that should not combine yeah, in my I opinion. agree. Um, Endorsed. But with, yeah, with that hard-hitting question and journalistic integrity, we're going to sign off for the night. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone who listened. I really appreciate. Yeah, that was fun. Um, uh, Horton Fears a Coup. It is on the About page of Delta Green Dead channels. If you want to know what the theme song is, it is public access and creative commons and i don't owe anybody money for it but it's in <laughs> i don't know how to say it uh all right thank you everybody if you want to listen to this later it'll be vod for two weeks here and i will have an audio podcast version of this uh up on delta green dead channels for all my lovely subscribers so uh, right. until i see a, you there we, do a, uh, we say we we will we save a copy through the youtube yes certainly uh, we, we pull the YouTube. VOD once we're done. Go to the, the YouTube. Go to that damn near YouTube. <laughs> See the talkie faces. Uh, all right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Baz, pull down the giant, you know, Tesla coil <laughs> lever that stops the stream. Just, Later, uh, Baz. Bye. Bye Thank everyone. you, Baz. Thank you, people.